Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea on see the show on your TV so we can talk about things musically. Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea. Listening to Jams and Tea. Welcome, everybody, to a brand new episode of the Jams Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and occasionally spill the tea. And oh, 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 man, we got a fucking episode for you today. We are going to be talking about Brock Hampton, boy band extraordinaire, favorite of the podcast. We have made videos on every single one of their albums at this point. So if you haven't seen them yet, please go check them out. We are going to talk about their new album Roadrunner, New Light, New Machine. Oh, I wonder what you think of it, Jake. We have That's talked true. about so. we've talked about so much Brockhampton in mm-hmm. the last few weeks that I only have one <laughs> thing to say, and that is real shit feeling saturated. And anyway, uh, the other album we're going to be talking about is uh, by a one Mr. Riley Walker. We're going to talk about his new album, The Folk Prog Vuckin. It's kind of like a it's kind of like a folk record, but played with jazz or instrument, not with jazz yeah. instrumentation. We're going to be talking but... about Course in Fable. We are going yeah. to be talking about that, and very special news. We are going to be talking about an album like we normally do after the normal episode, but this is a little bit different because we are starting, we are announcing our 1991 record fucking retrospective. We are going to be covering albums from this specific year because 1991 was a big fucking landmark year for so many albums, bands, music, just tons of shit is getting, uh, it's, you know, it's what, how many years ago is it now? 30, is that? 30. Fucking, yeah, 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 it's 30, 30 fucking years ago. Everything is turning 30, so we may as well cover some of the benchmark fucking entries in the genre and we are going to be kicking it off today in the secondary episode we are talking about massive attacks blue lines oh my god wow we are kicking the retrospective off with blue lines and what we'll be doing is over the next few weeks we'll be continuing the retrospective with a new 1991 retrospective discussion each week for the next few weeks and then we'll take a bit of a break and we'll come back to it in uh, august and september and october specifically because that was a time uh, around which a lot of huge records in the world of alternative rock were clustered so we'll, we'll be doing a bit of it now and then a bit of it later in the year. So stay tuned. And also, we have another thing to plug from a friend of the podcast, one uh, Thomas. You can find him on Twitter, at Dankest Thomas. He has released a uh, video detailing his favorite films of 1979. It's a very good video. Thomas is a uh, film queer boy sad boy we love him (laughs) he makes all the best uh end of the year lists and i've seen this one it's great gives a lot of interesting insights fascinating recommendations videos only 50 minutes long shorter than most of our episodes well worth. you have no excuse is what he's saying yeah there's a lot there's a lot to cover in that year i wonder if he'll talk about stalker yeah what What? no I've I've been DMing him throughout the whole process. He's been making this list and it's, it's been a lovely time. I'm excited for people who I haven't seen it yet, but Thomas, no, if all that jazz isn't on there, I'm going to bully you. I'm sure the video is great though. I can't wait to find out. If you want to hear someone who references, um, like restored Sergei Eisenstein projects, talk about his love for the idiot with Steve Martin. This is the video for the you. The jerk with Steve Martin. The, the jerk, jerk with Steve Martin. Steve Martin. Of course, Classic. Steve Martin's famous Dostoevsky adaptation. <laughs> his, or his uh, famous uh, film cover of the Iggy Pop album. Oh, yes. No. Boom. Also a, a cultural reference. Uh, so, yeah. I thought you were going to say a cultural reset. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The usually influential album. Anyway. Ooh. Anyway. So there's a lot happening, as you can mm. tell. 
Um, but we'll kick straight into our episode today with, as we normally do, our regular segment on what we've been listening to. Jake, what have you been listening to in the last seven days? Oh, God, just so god damned much. Uh, I gave a listen to my first album by uh, Husker Du. I listened to Zen Arcade the other day for the first time. Um, and I was just kind of like, I know vaguely what this album is like. And I just looked to scroll down and was just like, that's an awfully long runtime. Hmm. And then naturally I checked to see if it was including bonus tracks, if it, you know, cause it always fucking happens. But uh, to my surprise anyway, the album is just kind of good enough to the point where it wouldn't even matter just because the album is so goddamn energetic from front to back. It's just fun. It's, it's just like, hey, do you like having fun? I, I, I do indeed actually, that's fantastic. Well, and it's just a bunch of fucking whack punk post hardcore shit and it's ahead of its time and cool and I, I can't think of any reason why anybody who even vaguely is interested in rock music wouldn't like it uh yeah. it's terrific it's, uh, it's just two of the best songwriters in the country at that time in one band and it's fucking amazing talking about some some whack shit that's that is an album you need to keep genius around for because it'll it, it, it yields surprises Let's good, just say good that. For, good for a chuckle or two. Yeah. Um, I have been on a bit of a post-hardcore kick uh, recently, which, I mean, a couple of us have been, uh, as is our want. Um, so I was just like, you know, I, I listened to lots of Converge and Dillinger Escape Plan, as is my want. Um, but uh, in light of that, uh, Morgan recommended me an album by a band called Counterparts, uh, that's an album that I believe you have lined up for a record club one day, don't you? Yeah. So, you know, won't speak too much on it, but uh, I've been listening to a lot of good post-hardcore recently, and I can certainly say that that ranks very highly amongst what which, I have been Which to. album is it for our listeners? Uh, oh, goodness. Uh, nothing it's their most Left to Love. Nothing Left to Love. It's, it's basically, it's definitely very, you know, post-hardcore, mathcore kind of thing, but it's got like a very, very distinct emo bent in like vocally and even like lyrically, also lyrically. Wow, that is that is an album. I know that a lot of time people don't really like, like I think maybe uh, I listened to, or I read along with the lyrics of Converge's You Fail Me maybe the fifth time I had heard it. So, you know, not exactly a genre that thrives on its lyrical content necessarily, but I would say that that's notable exception, uh, allows you to appreciate it to the fullest extent. Um, and speaking of not being able to understand what people are saying, uh, in this case, it being because it's from a language I don't speak because I'm a filthy American fucking, loser uh another post hardcore band a uh, favorite of podcast friend zach listened to uh an album of theirs last <laughs> year uh i listened to uh, envy. envy yes uh and their album last year was really really good and i was just like man i need to get more into this band just because i feel like there's gonna be a couple records of theirs that are like gonna be killer and then i checked what they're like aggregate scores were on websites and i was just like damn these guys just haven't missed yep. so uh zach was like yo you need to listen to all the footprints blah, 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 blah. I don't all the footprints the you've ever left and oh i can't remember yeah. the rest of the title either it's, 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 it's fucking keeping I real shit. silent earth three <laughs> remember that one but uh yeah i, I listened to that that's and i weird. found I, I found it quite outstanding. I, I think that that's just a really great Meat and Potatoes post-hardcore album. Um, all, the, all the footprints I, you've ever left and the fear expecting a hit. There you go. Uh, uh, and I, I don't want to say that the title makes you think of like a certain album. It basically sounds exactly like you imagine it, but in like a, a, a really good way. Uh, so I'm going to be checking out more from them just because they're incredibly good. My, uh, my favorite album of theirs that I'll shout out in, in the incidents hmm. is uh, Dead Sinking Story, which is, I think, the second that's album they put out. That's, next up. That's, that's a level up. That's a great mm -hmm. album. That's just a great album of all of the genres that it takes from. That and then, like, they went in a, one. they actually went in a weirdly kind of post rock direction after that, which I hmm. found, found, find to be really cool as well. So, just awesome bands all around. Yeah, they, their record last year was really, really good. It had, like, 
it had a bit too much spoken word for my liking, but like overall it was definitely super post-rocky. So it was weird to go back to like kind of their roots, I suppose. But it's just like, yeah, they're a super eclectic and interesting group. So and that you know, dude if you just that dude, them, that dude just screams on those early I mean, records similar similar energy to the lead singer of boris who just like the, the intensity is one or ten nothing in between uh and that's how <laughs> i like it um i also listened to a band that makes no sense that i don't constantly listen to considering the pedigree and how much i like uh at least some of their records and that would be at the drive-ins in casino out for the first time in like five mm. fucking years um and i like that album a good deal um i i really i i'm definitely more of like a mars volta person just that's just where my tastes and inclinations lie uh but i definitely appreciate things like um relationship of command a lot more than i used to i still think that album's fucking great and in casino out's really good too uh, my only problem with it is that I just really don't like how it's produced. It sounds like the vocals and instruments like were recorded at the same time in two different rooms. It's really weird. Like I just remember listening to it and being like, what is, this is a little strange and cleanly produced August, for them. August fuming. <laughs> it's a good Indeed. album. Indeed. I, it, it, it is a very good album. He's, he's the rare psychopath that prefers that to relationship <laughs> of command. Yeah, of course I am. <laughs> You okay. yes, you fucking psychopath. I'll, yeah, I'll, I don't know I'll, how to wrap my mind around I'll, that. I'll I'll back you, August, and say that while I don't prefer it to relationship of command, I don't think they're really that far apart in terms of quality either. <laughs> okay, I've got um two la my two last things here. I listened to um well, I guess technically I'll just mention the band is that I started listening to Primal Scream, uh, notable for a couple of their albums like uh, Exterminator or uh, Screamadelica. Uh, and I listened to their first album, which is uh, really fun. Uh, I was kind of surprised to see that it's definitely a lot lower rated than their other stuff, which I mean, I kind of get because it's relatively unambitious, but it's like, you know, if you like good, fun psych rock, you really can't go wrong with it. It's a good time. Um, but gotta say, put on Screamadelica right after that. And I'm like, yeah, this is, uh, this, this, this be, this do in fact be better. It's just a very fun, danceable album. Very strange record. I look forward to getting into some other later stuff too. They're an awesome band. They're one of my childhood bands again because my dad just happened to be super into them when I, I was young. I knew that that's like, I was listening to this and I'm like, I bet Tyler was listening to this when he was like a fucking infant. Like this I, just makes sense to me. <laughs> it's, not like I, it's not like I just cho chose this stuff. It's that it was foisted on me and I ended up, you know, developing my taste around it. But I, asked for this. I didn't but choose I, this life. This <laughs> life chose me. My, my dad had Screaming Delica on cassette tape. I believe still does. And it was one of the first CDs I bought. Um, but they're just a really cool band. Like that record's like a really interesting fusion of like psychedelic music and like blues rock. That yeah, shouldn't it's, got, work. it's got a little bit of everything. And then they basically did the same kind of thing their whole career. Like they just switched up their sound from album to album. They went like full Americana on the follow-up to that record, like full Americana. Oh, um, like Tom Petty okay. styles. Um, and then they kind of veered away from that and did some more kind of electronic stuff. And then they made Exterminator, which is basically like a noise rock album. And then oh. they went bluesy again and they've still like consistently been good. Like they still put out good music. Like they're an incredibly consistent band for how long they've been active. Um, so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm super stoked to hear that new people are getting into them. Yeah, it's been, so, I've, I've seen the album cover for Screamadelica. Like I've seen it online everywhere for the last four years and i went so long of being like what the fuck is that cover what is that what who who when where why and now i finally know and that will um, be we might as well just say that that will be an album we'll be talking about as part of our 19 yeah that's right um in september um, and last i finally gave a listen to zach core and tyler core record a album i've been meaning to get to for forever just because i for some reason have not plowed through his entire back catalog considering i love pretty much everything i've heard from him so far and that's uh mount erie sauna uh which is just like if you just <laughs> need to like kick back in bed and just fucking vibe throw that shit on with the best pair of headphones you have, maybe partake in some uh, substances beforehand. And ooh, ooh, what an experience. That's such a textured record. Like it's it's definitely, like I, I kind of expected it to be like weirder and like noisier just because a lot of people have said it's kind of droney, but it's like not 
really i, I mean like um, uh records like ocean roar like way more like noisy and chaotic and blah but like this is just kind of it's a little bit more mellow but uh it's it's definitely my speed of phil elvram uh and i highly highly enjoyed it i will totally come back to that uh maybe i'll finally listen to all his shit because i'm fucking lazy because everything's good music's good i like it yeah sauna, rest my sa- case. sauna is super underrated one of my favorite phil projects actually my it, to me it's like more it's almost like a sort of a throwback to the microphone sound in, in certain mm. ways like it deviates away I from some that. of the stuff he was doing with mount erie in the late 2000s and early 2010s but um it's just super awesome um yeah love really? that record and it, yeah it just gets overshadowed by the fact that it was the last record he made before a crow looked at me and then people then so people came into phil a lot of a new generation of people became aware of phil um in the in the wake of that record and it kind of overshadowed a lot of the stuff he did before it so i didn't know it was that close i would have figured it was a little bit oh they were a couple of years apart but they were consecutive releases oh i still would have like if you asked me to guess when it was from i probably would have said like 2000s and very wrong apparently so yeah cool dope shit august what have you been listening to uh well first thing in preparation for today's discussion i heard the whole saturation trilogy something everyone has been telling me to do for a long ass time I finally finally did it I sat down I listened to them and generally they're good they're they're good records Uh, (laughs) I I would say the one I I I like them a fair bit I think three is generally a great record that one's love Mm -hmm. it a lot uh the other two I don't we we knew we were pulling hard for sat three with August yeah yeah the the other two I'm not quite as huge on but they're they get kind of, but the trilogy gets progressively better and better and better uh and i i would definitely get uh listen to them again they're very emblematic of the time they came out in that like period of 2000s like 2010s late 2010s tyler the creator uh post kanye stuff it's it's very interesting it's and I, I realized in going through the trilogy that I had heard like a majority of the songs on there already through <laughs> cultural osmosis. And it's I was like, going to oh. say, like, it didn't even matter if you were into them. If, when Saturation was like coming out, you if you were on Twitter, you were exposed to that music yeah, in no, one way it, or another. It's, it's so weird because it's like, oh, yeah, I know where that I remember that part from there or that part from there. And it's like, yeah, it was a very interesting experience. I uh, enjoyed it a fair bit, got me into uh, into the band some more than I was before. You probably uh, heard it based on uh, hip hop heads react to Junkie. And everyone yeah. freaking the fuck yeah. out because Kevin's that gay. What that, that video is oh. great. What's great about um, this is something that weirdly hasn't ever come up in our discussions with Brock Hampton. But what I think is one of the things that's also great about them is they're a great kind of intro and revival of the the general sound of West Coast hip hop. Like, um, yeah, if you want to sort of get into that whole vibe and the character of a lot of the great West Coast hip hop rap groups. <sighs> Um, rap acts, rap solo artists, then Brock Hampton kind of has a lot of the influence of them um, through a very distinctly kind of Gen, Gen Z 2010s filter. Yeah. Um, and so that's- Zoomer Wu-Tang. And, and, and like the, the, <laughs> the ultimate signifier is the fact that on all of their records, um, you hear that trademark um, G-Funk squealing synth tone. Uh, yeah. Uh, when yeah, that showed up on Roadrunner, I was like, it's my boy, yeah, he's yeah, back. Yeah, that, uh, so, yeah, but, that- that's a very Dre, like Dr. Dre did a lot in popularizing that yeah. sound. And yeah, so it really was like, yeah. There's heaps of Dre on, 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 I'm thinking of Gummy specifically, but it's all over the Saturation <sighs> trilogy. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Gummy's also, so fucking good. And also the thing about those records as well is I think they're really enhanced by hearing them in a particular context as well. Like specifically like hearing them with other people and also hearing them like in the whip, like when you're driving around, um and and just yeah i got stuff to say about that today yeah exactly and like because like when i think of the big the big sort of highlights of that trilogy songs like uh sweet for instance and um zipper 
and boogie and all that sort of stuff yeah. i think of like being in the car and just like blasting this stuff and and yeah. just feeling that whole energy it's it's a very okay. different listening experience now than it was in 2017 yeah. but it's interesting having a new perspective on on this band considering how hugely culturally uh everywhere they were in 2017 yeah my, my favorite memories of saturation trilogy is listening to it in jake's car just driving to Lexington, bumping Sat Three. That was those were the days. Bomb, 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 in my trunk, bomb, bomb, in my trunk. <laughs> All right, moving swiftly along, uh, from an album everyone has heard to an album no one has heard. Uh, I listened to Futuragelix, a collaboration between <laughs> producers Bryn dental and more ease i listened to this mostly because of the dental name and this this is interesting it's a lot of uh sound collage vaporwave adjacent kind of stuff it's about a it's a 30 minute long record and not all of it is great a lot of it is kind of formless and doesn't really progress anywhere but the parts that i thought were interesting and went places mostly relegated to the record's first half. I think are really uh, quite unique in their field of uh, just kind of sound collage not trying to be inherently musical stuff. So uh, if that sounds like your vibe, uh, give, it a, give it a listen. It's certainly unique. Uh, next, a record that I listened to because of our comment section, that being Nectar's Journey to the Center of the Eye, a 1972 concept space progressive rock album that I thought was, was quite interesting. It's got a lot of this very spacey atmospherics, like very 70s sounding synthesizers and guitar sound and guitar tones. It's a very, it's very emblematic of its time. It's just quite classic sounding progressive rock. I found myself a little bit unengaged in it at times, but I still think it's an interesting record worth uh, worth a, a listen. What's it called to. again? The title? Journey to the Center of the Eye. Okay. Got it. Uh, next thing, uh, Wires, Pink Flag, classic punk album, bunch of songs on here, very influential to post-punk. Uh, in fact, Wire, as I understand, even evolved into a post-punk band themselves. Yeah, it's, I think you can hear the seeds of that on Pink Flag, but it's obviously oh, yeah. a different record entirely. It's, it's also just a, a riffs for days album. Every song has like an interesting bouncy bass or guitar line. It's very kinetic, energetic, political, and also just downright weird at points. They where, have a number divided by 10. By 10. And, <laughs> and, yes. Yeah, it's, it, it gets is crazy. It's also really short, so listen to it. And finally, I'll close this out with the record I haven't shut up about this whole week. Yeah. From the Stiletto Formal, an album called Fiesta, 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 Fiesta. This is a progressive rock album, very heavily influenced by the Mars Volta that notably features a cello player as a key component of the band, giving a lot of strange, interesting atmosphere. But yeah, there's like strange jazz fusion sections on here. Uh, and there's also notably a rap feature on here where a guy just comes on this progressive rock track and starts rapping and it's, <laughs> it's kind of great. I don't know. I, I never have wanted something more than the hypothetical scenario of having um, fucking Zach De La Roca on a Mars Volta song. This is what I want in life. Yeah, uh, and but it's it's obviously not like a it, it's not like a Zach De La Roca type. It's it's like a like East Coast hip hop type rapping. Oh damn, they really be wild in then. Okay, like yeah, that that kind of shit, and it's. 
it, yeah, I, I loved it. I listened to it like half a dozen times this week. It's, uh, it's a big recommendation for me. And also no one's heard of it because it has like 68 ratings on Rate Your Music. Be the 69th, somebody, well, you do it. But no. Yeah, that's what I've been that's listening funny. to. Well, 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 uh, I'll go ahead and get this out of the way. I ha I am once again listening to the Dillinger escape plan, but not without reason <laughs> this time. Uh, because... Oh. Is that? Oh! 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 Got the wax. Eh. Yeah. Uh -huh. How, how expensive are those? Because, um... This, is, this was twenty-two dollars, but these are limited to five hundred. So I don't know if that's still because. Fuck psych. Oh. Ooh. Whoa. Ooh. Ooh. I love Reanimator. Hello, Reanimator. That, one, that, that one's clear, actually. But yeah, that's the vibe. Uh, and then the fucking other one, which is even better. Better be. <laughs> Bitch, I'll kill you. <laughs> that, ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, that's nice. That's mm. attractive. That is hot. Sexual. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, you're so, you're in luck. There's a hole. Oh. For my micro penis. Um. <laughs> 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 Say anyway, love me on the internet forever. Well, well, August put down a raise and then Morgan just called the bluff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was Daniel Craig coming back to the table at Casino Royale being like, last time nearly killed me. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I listened to, to both of those. They're both tens. Who knew what I would say? What? Crazy. <laughs> uh, so, furthermore... I gave a listen to Julia Holter's Aviary, which, to the surprise of goddamn no one, is amazing. Um, yeah. It's an hour and a half, and it could stand to be a little longer, frankly. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, I mean, just crazy shit. Truly really one but... of those records that feels like a world unto itself. Like, you yeah, can get like, you could... the comparison point. You could easily get lost in it. I, I don't even, I can't even think of something to compare it to, honestly. It's so unique. Like even as a Julia Holter record, it sounds like nothing else. Yeah. Finally, a record I'll give a shout out to is a oh. record by a band called Cave In, a metalcore slash hardcore record. I don't know. Um, called Until Your Heart Stops. Um Unfortunately, the, the, this band was first put on my radar because their bassist passed away in an accident uh, in 2018, and there were tons of tributes from the community about that. Uh, but I finally got around to listening to their first album, which is just a really fucking excellent uh, metalcore record produced, shockingly, by Kurt Ballou of Converge. Um, oh, shit. Yeah, um, yeah, real, real, real good stuff. Kicks ass. There's like, there's like eight minute uh, metalcore songs on there, so like that's it's pretty boss. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah, that's that's all I have really. Okay. Well, I listen to God forgive these bastards songs from the Forgotten Life of Henry Turner by the Taxpayers. Um, which is this concept album um, that takes stories that the lead singer had heard from a real life homeless sort of town legend um, and turned all these stories into an album. It's kind of insane. Um, and it goes, in, it goes very, very hard. Uh, and it's very dark and emotional and uh, jagged. Um, and it's been a favorite of mine for a long time, and I was really happy to give it a re-listen, and I, uh, I can't wait to do the record club. Um, and the other one is the new album by someone I talked about last week. Album came out today. 
uh, a one Mr. Amigo the Devil is born against. I cried at the end. Um, if it wasn't for one song which I don't like at all, um, this would be the best thing he's he's ever done. It's just insanely good. Um, and well, the thing is, uh, the bad song was one of the singles. So it meant out of the three singles for the album, there had been one song I really liked, one I thought was fine, and one that was awful. And I was dreading the worst because that was the same ratio for the last Biffy Clyro record. Um, so I was going and expecting the worst. And luckily, it was much better than that. Uh, and it's very emotional, very dark. This man, if you like uh, I See a Darkness or like Murder Ballads, there's stuff that you'll like here. Beautiful. Good to know. I, I'm looking forward to listening to that. Um, okay, so my week has been really interesting uh, musically. Uh, I've got a few things I want to shout out, both uh, re-listens to stuff I've loved for years and new listens. Uh, I'll, I'll kick off with the re-listens. I was delighted to return to um, the great uh, solo so, single album from um, Dark Side, which is the electronic collaborative duo of Nicholas Jar, who of course we are all well and familiar with, and the great uh, modern sort of funk guitarist uh, Dave Harrington. And so they put out one album together as a duo in 2013 called Psychic. And it's this really awesome mix of like Nicholas Jar's typical kind of like very atmospheric, but and detailed and and just really skin crawlingly good beats and atmosphere and these really just sexy licks guitar licks all over this thing it gives it a really kind of bluesy funky flavor that and this mix of electronic and and really uh crisp electric guitar goes together so well and i was i revisited it because i'm getting increasingly hyped about the fact that they are putting out a new record together this year mm. uh, in a few months time that i'm very excited to hear and obviously get, for us to get to review i think that um this kind of combination of nicholas jar and this great guitarist is the sort of dream collaboration that I would never have imagined would come to fruition and be as good as it is. But I, re I still would say that Psychic is one of the best electronic records of the 2010s and it's required listening if you're even vaguely interested in that sort of thing. Um, I also want to shout out, I listened to a, uh, a classic of, actually I listened to two sort of 2000s uh, era classics of sort of chill step, chill wave, like sort of um, down tempo is, is the specific genre. Uh, I listened to Ruiksop's album Melody AM, which is a childhood favorite of mine, a really relaxing sort of down tempo record uh, with a bit of house influence as well. Uh, if you enjoy albums such as Moon Safari by Air, you'll find a lot to enjoy about this record. Uh, very much a, an understated classic of its time um, that is in immensely nostalgic for me to listen to. Um, and also want to shout out, I listened to, re-listened to the debut record from the um, down-tempo sort of uh, techno slash house artist, The Field, titled From Here We Go Sublime. Again, a classic sort of ambient techno record um, built around, what's really cool about this record is that it's built around samples from pop music. Um, so there's uh, entire tracks that are built around samples from songs like um, Hello by Lionel Richie, for instance, and The Scientist by Coldplay. Uh, these pop songs from all these different eras. But what's cool about it is that he samples them in ways that are basic, makes it basically indetectable as a sample of that song, unless you know the song really well. Like he'll take that one second snippets of the song and he'll kind of build these ambient tapestries around them. Um, and it, it's just really, really awesome. An awesome record, really relaxing, but also at the same time, really engaging. Like the, even though it's an ambient techno record, the beats do really kind of kick and, it, and it's really engaging, I think. And I just, I just really love that album. Uh, actually, incidentally, a really stellar discography in general. Um, this was not a one hit wonder artist. The Fields records are great to listen to if you need some relaxing music to put on while you're writing, reading, or trying to get to sleep. Um, super highly recommended. Uh, I also listened to re-listen, another re-listen I did was to Earl Sweatshirt's album, I Don't Like Shit, I Don't Go Outside, <laughs> uh, which I listened to originally when it came out and enjoyed quite a bit, but I think 
I've needed to do a little bit of growing and a little bit of appreciation to really understand Earl. And there was something about his music that never fully connected with me in like around 2015 to 2017 that is just really heading now for whatever reason. Agreed. He's an immensely uh, talented and an, not just an immensely talented rapper. And he is an immensely talented rapper. Like his flows and his writing is unparalleled. He's, he's one of the best doing it today, frankly. And that's not a hot take. People will, people say that all the no. time, but I feel that perhaps it hasn't been underlined in recent years because he's been a bit quieter, but he's still really, really great. Um, but also he's a fantastic producer. Like he uh -huh. produced basically almost all of the beats on this record. And I believe on most of his, on the record subsequent to it as well. Um, and they're really fucking good. Like this is really dark shit, like <laughs> really dark, morose um, rap music. Um, I'm particularly enamored with the beat on Grief, which is just one of his best songs and absolutely- I was gonna say, house. that is a song. Also, Oof. also Wool as well is a great song with Vince Staples is fantastic. Everything on that album is fantastic. I yep. also, in conjunction with that, I listened to his single track EP Solace. Uh, I don't know Ooh. if any of you have heard that. It has like a- it's, it's not on Apple Music, I don't think. So I haven't heard it yet. Well, I'll tell you why I listened to it because I was on Earl's uh, Rate Your Music page and I was uh, list I'm looking up, I don't look shit, I don't get sorry. And I looked at under EPs and there's Solace with a 3.99, the oh. 15th highest rated EP of all time on that website. And it's just one 10 minute song, but it's kind of like a 10 minute song that has multiple different parts. Like there's about four or five different beat switches, long sections of it are entirely instrumental. And then he, occasionally he comes in. What it reminded me of actually was The Caretaker. It's very somber and demented and dark. It's probably the darkest thing I've ever heard Earl, Earl release, which is saying something. Uh, he talks very frankly about being suicidally depressed on this EP. Uh, it's a real, it's a, it puts you through the ringer, even though it's only 10 minutes long. And he only maybe says, I don't know, a dozen lines on the whole thing. It just really gets you. Uh, and it's a, quite comfortably the best thing I've heard from him. Um, so highly recommend carving some time out for that if you feel up to it. Um, it's astounding. We're, we're going to be talking about him on a record club in the future because I have some rap songs on there. Yeah, and that that I'm really looking forward to revisiting that as well. I think having uh, his earlier stuff when they click for me, I think that's going to be a revelatory experience that, going on to that. That absolutely was with me. Like, I thought it was really good when it came out. And then I just sort of listened to it now that I had gone back and listened to everything since, like, Doris. And I was just like, whoa, this hits. <laughs> My God yeah okay and so that's some of the re-listens i want to shout out as for first listens also had a really really good week um first thing i want to shout out is i've been finally at the uh urgency of our mutual friend of, of me and jake's at the very least spencer i've been finally getting into or started finally getting into the classic 70s pop band electric light orchestra also known as elo uh, and I listened to their album El Dorado. I've, listened, I've played this album three or four times this week. Uh, it's amazing. It's this, um, I think what Jeff Lynne, when he started ELO, he said the aim of the project was to pick up where the Beatles left off. And I think that's an interesting bit of context for what early ELO tries to go for. But I think it also undersells what makes ELO so unique is that yes, these songs, this record is very clear heavily Beatles influence, specifically Sgt. Pepper's influence with a bit of Abbey Road influence on it as well. But it's, it's entirely its own thing. Uh, it is this really lush orchestral rock record. So a great rock songs, but with massive string uh, arrangements caked over top of all of them and not caked over top in the sense that just plopped on there to try and make them sound bigger and better than they are but they're all just sort of weaved woven into the fabric of the songs uh in the same way as the best kind of like late era beatles stuff is but also just entirely different in attitude style charisma jeff lynn is not trying to be a beatle in, in the way that he writes and the way that he performs um it, it's a really awesome album uh it's just so ridiculously great it's also like this kind of concept record it's it's structured like dark side of the moon-esque structure as well where it has uh, it's just so awesome front to back really easy to listen to i'm so excited to dig into their big this isn't even one of their biggest records i'm excited to dig further into their records in the later 70s um as i go i'm going to be listening to another one really soon uh, awesome awesome album awesome band uh, if they continue at this rate anyway i can see them easily becoming a favorite band of mine uh, just a really great album absurdly good 
Uh, but not even the uh, best one, first one thing I got to mention about ELO real quick. Yeah, go for it. Is that now you're officially one step closer to full on weebdom, Tyler. Oh, you will be joining <laughs> us soon because ELO, their song Twilight is featured in the animation in the Japanese short film Daikon 4, Daikon 4 animated by Studio Gainax, Studio Gainax producing Evangelion. Huge gateway How show. How did I anime. not know that was them? What the fuck? Yeah, August just Mandela affected me. I, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> that was, I'm so glad that worked in the way I wanted it to. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay, so uh, next thing I want to shout out, I actually listened to this last night. Uh, I finally got around to one of the most beloved and one of the most talked about rap hip hop records of the 2010s, that being Schoolboy Q's Blank Face LP, oh, uh, yeah. which is basic, which came out in 2016 and is basically um, Schoolboy Q attempting to do his My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, his good, actually no, it's more like Schoolboy Q attempting to do his Good Kid Mad City sort of thing, but a fusion yeah. of the two. It's this really ambitious um, major like incredibly expensive sounding major label record have has huge singles on it interestingly enough the big single from the record that part with Kanye West is actually in my opinion one of the worst songs on the whole album so, <laughs> which is hilarious it's still a good song I think but it's very uh repetitive and Kanye's feature is incredibly grating in this in a way that you can only really appreciate if you're into Kanye but fortunately it's the only time Kanye shows up on this record this hmm. album has a really high profile list of collaborators, um, beats from a lot of um, great producers like Soundwave, um, The Alchemist, uh, who else is on the production on, on this record? Um, uh, Metro Boomin, all, the kind of all these really big and talented producers from this particular era of hip hop. Also great features, Anderson Peck and Kendrick Lamar are all over this record as well. Um, but it's just a really fucking good album. <laughs> it's really, really like, it's easy to see why it's so like widely celebrated and lauded. It sounds fantastic. The beats are stellar. It's a really kind of dark and, and, and dingy sounding record, but everything really pops on it. Um, it has a song, a groovy Tony, uh, which is a hilarious so title for a song, but it's like one of the best hip hop songs I've ever heard in my life. The beat on this song is absolutely absurd. It's like, it's not, this is not a comparison in terms of sound because the second song is a much more off the wall song, but it's like, ain't it funny levels of quality. Ooh. Beat. Uh, anyway, so it's a really good album, even though it's very long, it's like 70 minutes long. It's really like a bit bloated. It's still like a really fascinating document of its era and just really compelling from front to back. There are moments that are like deadly serious. There's a Vince Staples feature track, for instance, where they talk about like, growing up and like watching people get murdered and stuff and then like two <laughs> two songs later there's the song that where the refrain is just i'm a dope dealer in word i'm a dope dealer i'm a dope dealer over and over and over again and it's like the fucking funniest song ever like i don't mean it's not a repeated refrain like in a playboy cardi sense it's like a really funny uh tongue-in-cheek song that is just absolutely fucking so much fun to listen to so um Highly recommend Blank Face LP. I would say listen to it just to have heard one of the most important hip hop records of the decade, um, rather than necessarily whether you like it or not. I think you all will like it, but it's just one of those records that uh, tries so hard to be an instant classic and comes so close and falls short for such, like there's, there's a couple of songs on the record that are just downright misguided. Uh, there was a sex jam with Miguel on there where um, <laughs> Schoolboy Q just comes across as the least sexy presence in the history of hip hop. I was going to say, even if you have managed to come across as sexy, when you're doing a track with Miguel, like, do you really think you're going to come off favorably <laughs> in this comparison? The, the, the sad thing about the song is that Miguel even kind of doesn't come across that sexy. On the, anyway, oh, the no. thing about this record is it's just really fucking fascinating. Like, it's really, there's so much to talk about. Maybe I'll do a record club on it someday because there's Thanks. so much to dig into with this album it's really interesting even the parts where it doesn't succeed are Ugh. fail in interesting ways there's mm. nothing that's boring on this album that's basically the best way of selling it anyway the last thing i want to talk about i know i've gone on a bit in this segment but the last thing i want to talk about the best album i listened to this week another instant canon into my favorite albums of all time list 
Uh, and I'm pleased I finally got around to this record because I know it's one of our friend Pokey Gems' favorite albums of all time. Uh, the Blue Niles album, Hats. Um, so the Blue Nile, I talked to, I think, I don't know if I talked about them last week or not, because I listened to another album of theirs last week, but they're this kind of like, um, sort of, again, that sophista pop sort of uh, ornate um, pop bands in the vein of like Prefab Sprout and Tears for Fears, except these guys are much more stripped back and polished. Um, and this album, Hats, is just incredible, incredible um <sighs> pop music it, it it was just mind-blowing i got two songs into it and then i immediately stopped it got in the car and drove along the front of drove along the pacific ocean to listen to it because it was just one of those records where you hit, it, it's so atmospheric but at the same time so beautifully catchy and and moving um there's a song on there called the downtown lights which is straight up one of the best synth pop one of the best pop songs of the 80s it's as up there with everybody wants to rule the world and born in the u.s and dancing in the dark and all that sort of thing like it's just one of the best songs ever and i know i use hyperbole a lot but this is a record that really deserves it if there's one album you listen to that i talked about this week make it this one it's just gorgeous um and yeah so i had a really awesome week and that's it so now we move on to our first major uh record review of the day which is of course My mama said I didn't come into this world with tears Instead I welcome her with open eyes and open ears But came to glue to a few things that couldn't be repaired We saw a future in each other, blended hope and fear I guess uh, I am the, the, the resident Brockhampton stan Even though I'm far from the only fan But uh, <sighs> it's, it's something that up until, you know, like until we first covered Iridescence We really didn't get the chance to talk about Because last year was the first year we had gotten without a Brockhampton record, which was fucking bizarre for, even though everybody probably had other worries on their mind. But that said, we've definitely made up for it uh, in, in return now, just because this is a very quintessential 2010s act at this point, especially just, you know, that late 2010s, they're, they're, they're really big now. They, they blew up and everybody's just kind of looking to see what they're doing because they're young. And so, you know, if you want to find out all our thoughts about all this stuff, I already talked about the videos, so we can just launch into this. Roadrunner, uh, New Light, New Machine is supposedly the first of two albums, maybe, do not trust Kevin ever, but he <laughs> says that there's, yeah, again, which apparently they recently said within an, an interview with Anthony Fantano that they hadn't even really started that album yet, but that does not mean we will not get one this year because that's yes, just how they are. Kevin has also said in dubious tweets that he's retrospectively um, making this a sequel to Iridescence and part of the... And potentially might be releasing a collab EP with Matt Champion. We don't fucking know. I, but I, I, I think it's difficult to know how to interpret comments like that. Wow. Yeah. Um, I because I, 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 I listened to an interview where he said it kind of he said something along the lines of it kind of feels like a spiritual sequel to Iridescence, which is different mm -hmm. to saying that it is or was intended or has become. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's really Brockhampton are a very difficult band to talk about if you want to. Uh, take everything they say into consideration. Um, yeah. Which is why you, you simply should not. Yeah. I was going to say, which is why you pretty much shouldn't, even though I do think it's like, it is a part of their identity now at this point, just kind of fucking with people just because their release schedule is so tied inherently to themselves because, you know, they came from this DIY grassroots thing. But two weeks ago, which Again, I still can't believe it was that quick, but two weeks ago, we got the announcement for this album. There were sort of buzz talking about this record, but they confirmed it, said, hey, two weeks, album's gonna drop, new album. So here we are, and this is pretty fucking notable because I don't actually have a lot to unpack. These last two albums that we talked about, we talked a lot, all of us, about context. We talked a lot about the circumstances under which these records were made because they were intrinsically linked to what was in their content wise. However, this is sort of a, I won't say a fresh start, but this is definitely a new era. This is an era where we are seeing them collaborate with big, big industry names, many of them coming out of the gate 
embracing a more trap sound that they have not previously played with. It is a departure from all of their previous records, but also kind of an evolution as well. And they don't have a an event that has like, for a lack of a better word, poisoned the water around the release. Uh, instead, this is just a Brockhampton album. It is yes. the the it, it is simply new and it is here and we have heard it all right so what i think is important to us uh, another thing i think is important to establish context wise and, and that builds off of what you're saying is that this is um the longest longest gap there has been between brockhampton releases since they first came out and i think that's quite purposeful especially when you take into consideration the fact that and this is another insight that I gained from the interview. Apparently, they started working on this as soon as they finished Ginger. Like they didn't wait. Yep. They they have been working on this for uh, you know a year and a half. They have been working on this for the whole time that we've been waiting for it. Essentially, uh, they made three albums worth of material allegedly in the process of trying to realize the vision for this project. Uh, obviously, culled the best stuff and shaped it into the the thing that we have here. And I think the gap that of, in time that's elapsed may be partly due to COVID as well and the desire not to release a record um, under the imminent sort of wake of that shadow um, perhaps played some role in, in the time that's passed uh, to, to get to this record. But also I think that you're right. There is, was a clear desire for this to be a Brockhampton record that emerged uh, within a vacuum, basically, without being necessarily uh, tied too much to stuff outside of it. Like, this is, I think, the first Brockhampton record since the Saturation Trilogy that doesn't require uh, a deep analysis of the state of Brockhampton uh, outside of what's on the record to understand. It is an album that explains itself in, in, in straightforward terms, basically. It's an album that reveals itself in a way that is not coy in the slightest, is very direct. Uh, and, and purposefully so. It has some of their most punchy, punctual, and straightforward music that they have released since the early days. Um, but it also has a number of, of arrangements and uh, walls of sound, for lack of a better word, that are really ornate and constructed and detailed. And there's a curious mixture, I think, of that kind of trap influence stuff and stuff that's far from trap influence that's even reminiscent of early Kanye, for instance. Um, and I think that is a way in which that influence, which of course the story of Brockhampton is inevitably tied to Kanye West, the fact that many of them met on a Kanye West fan message board and that Kanye's influence and Kanye's cultural status is uh, undeniably a huge part of their creative force and, and their influence and their energy as artists. And I'm gonna, um, make a comparison that might make some people mad but i mean it in a good way <laughs> uh, that's what we do here i mean it in a good way and i haven't really fully thought this through but it just feels right to me to say this that i think this is brockhampton's life of pablo uh in a lot of ways oh, i get it but <laughs> i hate it <laughs> No, I, I mean it, and I'm not fucking backing down no, on it either. No, no, please, no, no, no. I, I'm I said, curious. I said I get it, I get it, but at the I same mean, time, is, like... It just is let, the, him, let him elaborate, and then I'll kill him. <laughs> <laughs> and for our listeners who may not already know this, this is not exactly a podcast filled with um, 2010s Kanye fans. Many of us are, <laughs> at best, uh, <laughs> agnostic. <laughs> agnostic. The, the, yeah. the only possible music podcast on the entire internet where there are more than two people and all of them do not like the life of Pablo. I, I don't hate the life of Pablo. I like parts of the life of Pablo and I respect the life of Pablo more for what it kind of represents in terms of the cultural nice for you. Part, cultural shift of hip-hop like whether you like them or not and i will be the first to levy heavy criticisms at kanye's 2010s work every single release he's put out this decade with the exception maybe of jesus is king but who knows what that effect that record will have in the long run every release he's, he's put out every release he's put out has in some way shifted and had a massive influence yeah. on the mm. shape of hip-hop the shape of right. popular and music the life of pablo introduced patch notes uh, to <laughs> The life uh, of Pablo is DLC on a on a purely kind of uh, <laughs> on a purely uh, intellectual level in terms of if looking at the 
the ways in which it had an, uh, an actual effect on the world of hip hop. Life of Pablo may be one of the most influential things Kanye's ever done. But anyway, I'm getting away away from myself now. Yeah. What yeah. I what I mean from by this comparison is that this is uh, a sprawling record. It's a record that uh, integrates um, influence influences of uh, spiritual uh, imagery and sounds and uh, like the, the whole new light, new machine type of thing. Uh, it's a record that kind of shouldn't really work as well as it does. It kind of feels patchwork at certain points. There, are, It has a relentless pace to it, as I think that the life of Pablo does to its arguable detriment. It has a relentless uh, forward motion to it and it will go in a whirlwind fashion from one sound um, to something that is completely different. And I think uh, an ideal instance of this is just the first five or six songs of the record, which are all over the shop, all great songs. Well, mostly great songs, but complete patchwork. Uh, and they managed to pull it off through sheer force and sheer bravura and through really uh, creating this kind of mixtapey feel, I think that this record has, where, you, where songs are kind of just bleeding into each other and there is a real kind of irreverent feel to it. Like for instance, even though we've had um, structure, even though we talked about some of the structural issues that a record like Ginger has, for instance, that record is so much more composed and um, clearly defined structurally than this record or any other Brockhampton record. In many ways, this record has some of the same kind of freewheeling mixtape energy as the Saturation Trilogy or I suppose Iridescence, but I don't know, I don't really, I kind of get what Kevin's sort of saying and in, in, in that it feels like a sequel to that. But to me, that's that Iridescence and Ginger are the two records that this is the most different from in basically mm -hmm. every way. But anyway, th this whole thing has a really kind of, fr again, freewheeling and fun and just purely carefree spirit to it, except when it doesn't, that I think really separates it and makes it feel in many ways like the quintessential Brockhampton record, like an absolutely perfect summary of their whole artistic ethos and their whole, uh, the whole style that they've reached for, the style that, uh, and the qualities that made them so beloved and made them so immediate and made them so hard hitting in 2017, but completely infused with uh, more ambitious sounds, more ambitious arrangements, more ambitious uh, production styles, more ambitious features, uh, well, just features in general being an addition. And everything about this speaks to a desire to harness the creative energy that made them such a force in 2017 and make it feel uh, renewed and with a renewed sense of purpose and with a renewed sense of urgency, basically. And I think that that's what um, Kanye tried to do with The Life of Pablo in terms of following up Jesus, this really uh, this real kind of diversion. Uh, and I think that it is what Brockhampton do with, with Roadrunner in a really interesting way. Uh, this is a record that just, I think, flat out bangs from front to back. There's not, there's a couple of songs on here that I'm, well, really only one song on here that I'm not huge on, which is Count On Me. And I really, the reasons why I'm not huge on it are, are kind of insignificant. I just think that it could have been fleshed out a little bit more, could have maybe had one additional verse, been made a little bit longer, but it still fits within the flow of the uh, early half of the record before it settles into a kind of groove halfway through. Uh, I really like, like the aspects of this record that make it the most objectively flawed for lack of a better word are the also the aspects of this record that make it the most uh fun and attractive and engaging to me like for instance a song like um bankroll which i absolutely adore is one of my favorite songs in this record it's a really strange combination of sounds like it's this really moody and ethereal and um dark beat it, 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 it definitely has an influence has signs of the influence of certain sort of uh, production styles that have come out of popular rap music in the latter half of the last decade. But then on top of it, you have this really abrasive trap beat um, and you have flutes at certain points that are playing in this track. And you have these really charismatic performances on this song from ASAP Ferg and ASAP Rocky. Um, Ferg's flow on this track in particular, I think is one of the great, what well, maybe I have to think on this. I think Ferg's feature probably a hot take, might, might be my favorite feature on this record even. I just really dig what he does. Um, although the other features are all great, I just want to give a special shout out to this one because I feel like it gets a bit, it might get a bit overshadowed by um, Danny Brown and JPEG Mafia. But this is a really awesome song. 
Uh, I, I really love it. Uh, Merlin in particular is really great on this track. I love whenever Brockhampton give Merlin a chance to shine. And I feel like um, it's very easy to analyze and go into the lyrical density of artists like Joba and Kevin Abstract and Don McLennan, for instance, but it might be slightly easier to neglect just how uh, great Merlin is and actually writing, even though his style is much more punctual and um, uh, less dense for lack of a better word uh he look there, there's a subsect of the internet ju that just does not like merlin and i'm here to tell you that you need to go home and log off because you're fucking wrong stop do not he's my son i will protect him he just fuck has you these, he just has this really off the wall energy and these really bizarre bars like his verse and bankroll kicks off with the lines i won't take off my armor now i can't afford not to splurge on her had to break down the berlin wall just to come talk to you which is such a, a so <laughs> so many gems on this record from him make, make so her, so many make her run like the boston bomb <laughs> that's yes that's my fucking favorite i was gonna mention that line i love that one um and also uh, oh lord Another um, <laughs> another great aspect of this track, and I'm zeroing in on this track for a few different reasons. One is that I believe it's the oldest song on this record. It was originally, it's been, it's existed in demo and leaked demo form in many different uh, forms for years now. Um, but it exemplifies, I think, so much of what uh, this record captures. Uh, another thing that it, that it showcases as well is the increased presence of Jabari on this record as a vocalist. Uh, he has yes. a a really uh -huh. cool like he's got a much more muted um vocal tone um than a lot, basically every other member of brockhampton uh and he's basically the inverse more. of merlin in a lot of well, ways I, before we go into jabari i think it's important to note that like it's incredibly important to throw on the record that he has previously done a lot behind the scenes in terms of oh absolutely yeah, yeah yeah no no yeah. absolutely he's, he's he, a, he, yeah he knows how to make his own voice sound really identifiable and important using digital techniques and it's just all over what he does because he knows how to make everyone's voices sound that way because yeah, that he, is he's good at it by now he, he, he's great at doing that but i really like his um i again this is going to sound like a negative connotation but i really like the kind of sleepy flow he has he raps really quickly but he kind of has this kind of fuzzy tone to him that i think is i don't know i, I find it really uh pleasing to listen to <laughs> for some reason um he's not exactly one of the best biggest lyrical presences on this record but i think that his presence as a vocalist adds a lot in many ways this feels like um and this is exactly what i wanted from this rockhampton record it feels like a record that truly gives everyone a moment to shine in a way that you have other Brockhampton records where definitely everyone is contributing, but there are certain members who are out sh outshadowing or having disproportionate presence than others. Whereas I think this is a record where really everyone is all over this thing. Um, another uh, presence I want to shout out who I think might potentially also be comparatively overlooked is that I think that Matt Champion is really great on this record as well. Um, he has... Uh, I haven't actually had a chance to really dig into the lyricism of this record for, in, in terms of his part, but he gives a lot of charisma to his performances on here as well that I really, really like. I think also um, it's worth shouting out, of course, um, in this regard, the track Windows, which gives basically everyone a chance to shine. Uh, and is really like this um, almost like a mission statement track for Brockhampton at this point in their career. It's like, it, it is like basically... A, a, a refresher on why this group is so great and why their diversity is their biggest strength basically you get all of these different styles all of these different perspectives all of these different lyrical interests that are all kind of coalescing within this one song in a way that's really really great um yeah and and then there are just the moments in this record that really do things that are so unexpected for brockhampton as well like, um, for instance, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about certain tracks and digging into them because I know there are other people here who are going to do that. But uh, I'm just on a purely sonic level, um, the instrumentation and the orchestration of songs like The Light, for instance, which is just this massive, uh, huge um, <laughs> rock influenced <laughs> 
gigantic wall of sound type track is is was absolutely jaw dropping. I'll never forget the experience of uh, me, Jake, and Morgan listening to this record for the first time and kind of like messaging each other. And this track happening, <laughs> we were just basically speechless. Um, it, it's really something. And then um, one of my favorite uh, instrumentals on this whole record is again the Kanye influence is heavy on the song "When I Ball," which has these really uh, again ornate lush string arrangements are so late late registration so john bryan um but also brockhampton make that their own it doesn't just feel like they're trying to do a late registration registration era kanye song they build on that in such a great and charismatic way um i think that uh maybe the most interesting track on this record and i'm probably going to end my review here uh, just for the sake of not stealing too many points but i think the most interesting track on this record uh and one of the ones that I've returned to the most and 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 it seems to be one that a lot of uh, fans have responded to pretty heavily is Don't Shoot Up the Party, which is uh, an absolute showcase for Kevin Abstract, for one. Um, and, and Matt's also great on the song and, and um, I, he also has actually one of his best verses. Kevin and Matt both give some of their best verses on the whole record on, on this song, but particularly Kevin, I think, dominates this track. He has a really potent and um, socially relevant verse on a record that for the large, mm. for the most part, I think eschews kind of social relevance, but I th which I think is what makes this track so much more punctual and effective. Yeah, and, um, and his flow is like, it sounds like he's on like pirate radio, giving yeah. like a political diatribe. It's crazy. Yeah, he has, he is what I like to, what I refer to as junkie energy on this track. <laughs> um, I think he, he, yep. he channels that kind of vocal performance that he gave on that song with the same kind of real sort of urgency in what he is actually saying as well. It's also a really complex uh, song in terms of what it's actually about and the different interpretations you can take from it this idea of not having the not don't shoot up the party um both being a kind of uh, direct reference to um gun culture in america but also like talking about um some of the more toxic aspects of hip-hop culture and and also just like in general fan and stan culture as well there's a little bit of that that's more subtext than text in this song as well but there's so many different readings you can give to this track that i think are relevant to the story of brockhampton and are relevant to their place in uh 2010s hip-hop i think another thing about this track that's exemplary of that is again the heavy presence of g-funk sounds in this track <laughs> incorporated awesome. into a much heavier more electronic backdrop i think that ties um the core musical roots of brockhampton into um, the modern day in a way that's really cool um yeah just everything about this song is is brilliant i it's it's actually my most played song on the record so far this weirdly enough this and bankroll which i think are two of the less um i don't know two songs which are less maybe about i don't know i think when people think of this record they, they're going to think of songs like buzz cut they're going to think of the light part one and part two and that sort of thing um but for me like bankroll when i ball and don't shoot up the party have been the songs that i've been returning to the most because they're just so different but so brockhampton in, in ways that i find really uh attractive and really su surprising and that was the thing about this record is i was not expecting to be as surprised as i was listening to it with how much um, diversity of sound there is in this but also how well it flows together again the transitions between tracks is also something that's worth remarking on this thing is just one big party from front to back it has the highs it has the emotional lows it has um, basically everything I think you could want from a Brockhampton record uh, it, again I said that earlier and I'll repeat it again just to be my kind of final punctual point it is quintessential um, I haven't touched on every track here. I don't necessarily want to because I know so many people will have so much to say, but I might ch I might chime in at certain points if other things occur to me. But yeah, I, I adore this record. Um, again, I said something I said, uh, I can't remember whether it was when we reviewed Iridescence or Ginger. I think I said it when we reviewed Ginger, is that um, to me, Brock, I don't think Brockhampton will ever make a perfect album. I just don't think that is in their design nor in their interests. I think that the things that make Brockhampton messy, imperfect, um, are the things that make them so interesting and are the things that have make, made them so lasting as well. Mm. Um, the, their willingness to continue to uh, 
expand, always have the idea of what the Brockhampton sound is, what the Brockhampton image is, as I think also can be illustrated in some of the really surreal um, visual imagery of this record's sort of um, aesthetic. And that's a whole other thing we can talk about as well as the aesthetic of this album cycle. But anyway, um, the, the whole thing with Brockhampton is they continue to try and shift and change and expand what people think of as the Brockhampton aesthetic, the Brockhampton sound, the Brockhampton look. And this is, I think, uh, beautifully treats the line of doing that, but also staying true to what has always made them attractive and what people have uh, come to love about them in the first place. It's a really difficult thing to do, to continue to feel like you're progressing in interesting ways, but also to maintain an audience that have admittedly become increasingly hostile towards this band for not uh, maintaining a certain perceived energy. Um, and so I think that Brockhampton have pulled off something incredibly impressive with this album. And I and I am definitely I definitely know that I'm biased, and many of us are biased in, in saying that as huge fans. But I really can't imagine this being much better than it is. Certainly for me, and certainly as a as an album experience, it's just the most fun album of the year so far. Tyler, you said something perfect. Something that I was that this this you all you all know what this is about at this point. Anybody who's watched this podcast knows what this whole shtick is, what our dynamic is, what we do. And, you know, what I do is I, I find a record every once in a while and I dismantle it and I put it back together again and I come up with some whack, crazy, <laughs> galaxy brain, stupid shit. And then I vomit it. But there are times when people say very specific things that make me think, maybe I'm not totally fucking crazy. And Tyler, it's, it's the word. You said that this was a party. I would like to elaborate on that. <laughs> so just to broadly get it out of the way. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm wearing merch. I got the CD. We talked about saturation albums. I'm a big fan. Everyone knows this. So, you know, Tyler said, you're, you're inherently sort of predisposed, like bias, whatever. These things are not important to me anymore because to be honest with you, if you find a group of musicians that you like and you consistently enjoy their output, yes, you're going to be biased towards them. That's called having taste. That's, that's, that's what it, this all is. So the, the people who get so caught up in, you know, all of this culture minutia bullshit, just talk about Don't the music and like what you yeah, don't watch our channel and talk about the music and stop fucking paying attention to this needless shit and listen to what we actually have to say. And yeah, um, I love this album. I, I love, love, I am not even love, I am in love with it. It, it managed to do something like I was fully, fully prepared. I, I voiced this concern amongst everyone else too, that I just like, you know, I loved Buzz Cut as a single. Count On Me didn't really hit me as hard as I wanted it to as, uh, um, when it initially came out. And there was just something about all of this, how Kevin just came out of nowhere. And it was just like, yeah, album in two weeks. And, you know, also maybe another one this year, who knows? There was just something about the atmosphere that made me go, is this one going to be the one where I just kind of walk away from it thinking, eh. So I fully prepared myself for failure. And, you know, you can get caught up in the fact that you really like something when you first listen to it. As Tyler talked about, my experience listening to this with him and Morgan at the same time is one of my favorite musical experiences I've had in some time because we just sat there playing it simultaneously on Twitter DMs, freaking out about every single line, every single bar, every single verse, everything we could point out. It was, it was such an immaculate time. And that's that's why I like music so much. There's a communal joy to it. And I haven't felt a communal joy like this since saturation. And I, and I caught the tail end of that. So I didn't really get to experience it. This, on the other hand, feels like it came at the right place at the right time to, to be what it is for us. And I, I deeply appreciate it. And yeah, in many respects, it's a patchwork album. Brockhampton, as Tyler said, they're not looking to make a perfect record. I, and I think it's important to point out too that 
I think most artists aren't looking to make a perfect record because who fucking does end up making a perfect record? I think like five records are perfect. Who gives a shit? Yeah, like, how, I, how the, I would phrase it is they're not looking to make a perfect record in this instance. They're looking to make something that bangs. And yes. this thing bangs. There's one moment where it doesn't bang, uh, which is Dear Lord, but also yeah. that moment is there for a very important purpose. So for the oh, most yes. part, for the most part, this record is just front to back bangers. And I think that, that that's really kind of well, to me anyway that that's the most uh, important way of of capturing the record and and, and, it, and describing y- it you're right it is front to back but even in its most gnarled ugly and darkest moments of which it does have a healthy few it doesn't ever stop and you know that might be an obstacle for some but i got to applaud the audacity to just make a record that just never stops having momentum. Like there is, you know, there are cuts here that are definitely more low key than other ones, but the way that they seamlessly flow into each other, that process of them whittling down this track list from three albums worth is, I think, basically, it, it's felt. You you can absolutely feel that that is what happened. And I think that, you know, it's your mileage will vary. That could be a problem for you. You could think it's a bit too patchwork because, you know, Brockhampton, a lot of people, a lot of voices, maybe it's not all going to congeal for you. And I don't really think that anyone should begrudge you of that. But it's about the tapestry. It's about the kaleidoscopic fucking magnolia shit, how everything weaves together. And that's where the magic of Roadrunner lies to me because it weaves itself together much tighter than any other release of theirs has so far. I will say, I'll, I'll have two things uh, and I will run through them as quickly as I possibly can just because I have a lot to say and I, I know that I don't want to sit here for fucking ever, but on some like a more aesthetic kind of appreciation for it because there's a lot to appreciate here even more so than other Brockhampton records and a sort of more conceptual take a look at because I feel like, you know, Tyler said it has kind of a mixtape energy and I completely agree with that. But it also definitely does not mean that there isn't something a bit more ambitious or grand that's at play here because there's just, there are too many things here where the stars just happen to align. But on a more just general note, it bangs the fucking, I don't need to say anything about bankroll or not bankroll about buzz cut because we've all been listening to buzz cut and buzz cut just it whips it's one of the most fun Brockhampton songs it's it's colorful it reminds me of iridescence in a lot of ways a lot of really good ways but the sound is less jagged it's less chaotic it's a little bit more focused but it doesn't sacrifice it for being too tight and wound it's a little bit smoother the production is just through across the record just fucking insanely good especially when you consider that this whole trap edge that's uh tenting a lot of their sound is something they haven't really played with before uh you know kevin comes on to buzz cut he's enthusiastic he's kind of got a fire here that he may not have had on something like ginger good contrast there's a confident triumphant tone that the instrumental kind of has here there's a there's a heavier larger sound uh kevin's talking about his humble beginnings uh and how he that brought us to where he is now talking about the days where he'd crash on people's couches or making reference to topics he's touched upon in the past and past music he's made his relationship with his mom his connection to his cousin the mentions and developments that um last year brought briefly addressing things like incarceration or COVID-19. Um, my favorite line he's got here in this verse is, web of life is my weave, false dreams stripped by silence, which is just, there's there's always like that one little kernel, that one little line in every Brockhampton verse where you just kind of pick it out there and you're just like, ah, yes, brilliance. That's what that is. Um, and you know, Danny Brown, he's Danny Brown, comes on here. I really actually like his contr- contribution lyrically, which I feel is sort of 
you can kind of pass over you just because you're just kind of appreciating the fact that Danny Brown is on a Brockhampton track and he's going fucking bug nutty like he just walked off of recording Atrocity Exhibition and he's fucking you know he's talking he kind of has something raucous and funny going on but um he's hinting at something more emblematic of the band uh when he talks about there being a lack of a mold for black musicians and how you sort of make your own mold and set your own standard by becoming successful which is basically the story of Brockhampton. They, they are self, they're a self-described boy band who set out to go be different and be trendsetters and to make their own mold. And now they're here. And then the final third, you got this spacey R&B switch up, saxophone, fucking saxophone. Yes, every song, every fucking album in existence. I don't care what genre it is, put a fucking saxophone in it because it's hot and it's fucking great. Ah, it's 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 boisterous and fun, and at buzz cut is bottom half tracks on this record. Tbh, uh, I love it, but doesn't even scratch. Um, I really like Chain On. Uh, it's a really really simple bass heavy beat with that kind of like electronic blip. It you know might turn off some with how simple it is. It's definitely sort of a new thing to do, but that, I that, think that's a great. And sorry to interrupt. That's a really great an instance I think of minimalism being perfectly uh, implemented on an otherwise maximalist project. Like gives the the, uh, the record an early and necessary bit of breathing room. While at the same yes. time, the pace of the whole record, the thing that the relentless energy of it is not stopping either. It's just, <sighs> so good. No, yeah, like that's what I'm saying when it has like, yeah, it's switching up styles and 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 themes and all, all these things very constantly but in always a very logical way. The energy changes and shifts and the way this ebbs and flows, it has an intentionality. It may not work for you, but the way it moves is what makes this such a brisk listen. And um, I, I love that beat. I love how simple it is, especially because you get JPEG Mafia coming in and just dropping fucking heat on this verse, just fucking, <laughs> It's, it's, it's I, 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 I love JPEG Mafia just because he's such a fucking weird ass character and he just comes in and he's talking about shit. He, like, a, he has references to Family Matters and That's So Raven in this verse. And Street Fighter. Like, <laughs> dude just doesn't have an off switch and he's just, he, and he comes on. But he also manages to work in the fact that he is also kind of a grassroots internet artist and how like, you know, oh, I used to get views in the double digits and now they're using me for clout. I'm just like, fucking pop off, King. And there's there's such a confidence. There's an exuberance here. And I, I, I love These it. These melodies um, need Duolingo. <laughs> these melodies need duolingo and then the duolipa line what a what a chad but that that still gets in the way of the fact that dom comes on the other end of this and is every fucking bit as good um he he comes on and he's got this kind of usual flow but then he keeps changing his inflection a little bit especially near the end and he sounds like more confident and specifically that line where he's just like channeled by my ancestors and i'm just like you put some fucking stink on that, Dom. What the fuck was that about? Do that again. Uh, and I, I really love- fucking dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's but... another thing. Dom's tone on this record, like his vocal yeah. tone, is really interesting. Like he tries some, some new things on this record that I think he pulls off really well. Uh, another moment that I'm sure you'll mention, but I meant, meant to mention and forgot to, is um, uh, it's Windows, I'm pretty sure, is the song where he comes in with this really heated flow and this really heated aggression, and then he just fucking ramps it up. Yeah, we, there were, when we were all listening to it, and I was just like, he's going at 10. And then the second he picked up, Tyler was just like, um, he invented 11. <laughs> He did! Tom McLennan invented 11! And oh god, he's he's so good at just like, you initially are just so impressed by what he's doing on a very textural level. And then you look into the lyrics and you see that, you know, he's talking about how black, uh, black culture has been fueling him in a racially divided America and how culture has been like from his ancestors, as he, as he puts it, is, is driving him to do this and to make this music and to be a part and participant and voice in all of this, which is just like such an emblematic idea of why this band does what they does the way they do it. Um, it's, uh, I also just love the swinging from a chandelier in Babylon line. It's just so like, you hear that and you're like, oh, that's, that's an evocative little image. Um, and it's also, you know, 
tenting about their rise to success. It, this, it, it really gives the energy that this is the victory lap, that whatever was going to come after Saturation 3 originally was supposed to be. This is just the very much three years worth, like in the making victory lap that they finally get to take here. And they get to be more adventurous. They get to be more confident. They get to be more colorful. And they get to use everything that they've learned on these past two records to use that and make it even better. So this is likely a, pre like, again, it's not like I've heard it or anything, but this is likely a more interesting and better project than we would have gotten before. Um, one, one additional thing I want to bring up um, that I just noticed on this track is um, this song, I think, and it all, it just, just because I'm only bringing it up because it speaks to what you're talking about, about Dom yeah. talking about black culture and the influence of, of, and his, the influence of black culture specifically on the momentum of, of him and Brockhampton and the, their energy and stuff. Um, there's a sample at the end of the song of um, Cream, Wu Tang's Cream, yeah. classic. Um, what I think is interesting about that is that that I can is kind of like a little bit of a capstone on Dom's verse. It kind of yeah, a uh, bit of a signifier. All the dollar bills, y'all, and also kind of a bit of a flex that they managed to clear that sample. Um, <laughs> and well, but what's interesting about that is that then later on in "Don't Shoot Up the Party," Kevin has a line where he says, "I knew about In Sync before Cash could rule me," which again mm -hmm. is a reference to the same song, Cream. And so that what that touches on is like that sample is utilized in chain on to talk about the uh obvious to acknowledge the obvious influence and their place in hip-hop and specifically within the realm of hip-hop groups brockhampton always get compared to uh wu-tang for good reason i guess it's a really easy comparison and they kind of do fit that mold i think it's a better comparison than the other comparison that always gets made with brockhampton which is to odd future anyway um but what's interesting about that is that you get the acknowledgement of that in Chain On, and then you get a kind of subversion of that in uh, Don't Shoot Up the Party, where Kevin's talking about, yeah, yeah, well, I know we're obviously like the new Wu Tang or whatever, or we're obviously trying to be the new Wu Tang or whatever, but also pop music uh, is kind of at the forefront of our influence in a way that I think is that Kevin is trying to state is, is bigger, more present than necessarily the history of hip hop culture as well. So I think that 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 callback that that i believe that sample is probably in chain on so that that callback and don't shoot up the party has an additional resonance and together i think again this album has these kinds of moments where you'll get a reference to an earlier song or you'll get a completion of an earlier reference or you'll get a these kinds of moments where things come full circle in a way and it's a testament to their structure um, there's how good they are at structure and how good they are at kind of weaving a tapestry of of weaving their disparate thoughts together into a tapestry that comes together into a whole that's more than the sum of its parts. It works both as a meta commentary on Brockhampton and also as just music that is fun and awesome and clever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I love that about it. And I, I just think it's a really great track. I think it's very simple. It gives you a sort of lull in the energy. Transition seamlessly into Count On Me, which, you know, as a single, as I alluded to, I was a little bit more mixed on this. I liked it, but it was just, you know, it didn't really hit me in a particular way, but it has really grown on me um, as I'm 90 to 100 percent sure my biggest problem with the production on this song was that the hi-hats were mixed too high on the original single version and this version of the song does not have that problem so maybe i'm just crazy but that's what it seems like to me but um it has grown on me because i think it is sequenced perfectly i think the hook on it is fucking godly i find myself just walking around my house saying this shit constantly i love the beginning of the instrumental with the little whistling and asap rocky sounds great on his feature here talking about the effects of pursuing money in a single-minded way in the industry and how it can blind you and then the chorus comes in by ryan Beatty, sean mendez and jabari all at the same time and holy fuck this shit is slick it's so good it's so sweet it's like fucking honey it's so good um and it's also really like heartfelt too it's it's reassuring that they can you know as the song says count on each other despite things like gossip fame money things trying to get them to stray from their intended path so there's this nice interplay interplay remember that with the verses here where the verses seem to act as challenges and problems they could face and the chorus is like the rebuttal, which gives the song great momentum. Uh, so Gone So Flexi comes in talking about drugs, Matt Champion comes in talking about general insecurity, and the chorus follows up to counter the both of them, just like before. And I think this is actually really important to unlocking the thesis of what this album is, in that it features a lot of direct exchanges between members, back and forth reassurances, and like they're speaking to each other through the music, um, 
uh, rather than their far more self-contained verses on every other album in their catalog, where even if they would reference like things that happened to all of them, things like Iridescence are basically them in a revolving door where you're paying attention to each one of them, one after the other, and you just sort of like take them at face value. Whereas here, there's a bit of mixing. There feels like an element of communication that you're witnessing. And this is just sort of where this is planted. Uh, Bankroll uh, is a great song. Uh, ASAP Ferg comes on here sounding super animated and fun, further building on the theme that Brockhampton has explored before, financial security contributing to their general peace of mind. Matt Champion comes onto the chorus kind of, sounding kind of sleepy, but it's then countered by a far more aggressive delivery also by him as these woodwinds fucking come in on the beat and it just sounds fucking fantastic. I like it, it, it knocks and it's probably my least favorite song on the record. And I, I think it's fantastic. And they couldn't take that from me. They want love, they got me. They got me. Ah, oh, it's fuck. Mm. Uh, just, it just buries itself into you. And uh, we, we fucking, uh, we get the internal reassurance with one another as Merlin Woods vocals say things like, you don't have many friends, but you're the shit to me. Every time you're at a party, it's a scene. And all these little tiny things as if he's trying to give a pep talk to a friend who's in like denial. And Merlin's verse is a whole lot of fun, uh, as mentioned, run like the Boston bomb line. Uh, but his verse seems to universally be about making the best of bad situations, which is basically a microcosm of what his band has literally always done in a macro sense. Uh, the beat slows down as the song progresses and several lyrical allusions to being in the sunken place start to manifest here via sound. And by the tone of the deliveries here, it sounds like the attempts to reassure whoever uh, the main character of this song might be aren't working as they're slipping into this sunken place and the reassurances just get further and further away. And you sink into this dark place and the instrumental shifts its tone, which I think goes perfectly into the light, which Tyler has mentioned the fact that this is a song that many people are talking about and uh ah wow okay time to do this okay i think the tonal shift that bankroll takes in its final segment is like fucking fantastic it's just a great way to transition uh as it feels like it consists both uh th this is joba and kevin at their lowest and their darkest and i think that you can probably read the previous song as maybe being directed at the both of them or at the very least at joba um, as if they are the ones being spoken to. It starts with this chilling, immensely relatable voicemail from Joba talking about his father's suicide this past September and how the state of the world at hand is fucking terrifying and how he's trying to see the light in all of it so he can hold on to something. There's this slowly building organ sound on the track and it has this eerie start until the distorted guitars literally just fucking crash into this song like thunder. And then when the beat properly begins, I, I chills, fucking spine tingling every single time. This is one of Brockhampton's most incredible sonic achievements. I've never in my life heard a beat quite like this. It is hard. It is fast. It's ugly. It is Heavy. You're, you're not going to you're not going to like this comp I'm about to make, but I do think it's genuinely a point of of uh, reference and influence. Is that the guitar instrumentation on this and the way it's incorporated into the rap format reminded me a lot of Rick Rubin production, uh, and I think because no, they've, yeah. they, they've worked with Rick and he's kind yeah. of been one of their big proponents, I think that's kind of maybe a, a way in which that has manifested in the actual music itself, like. Rick, obviously, uh, uh, hugely known for, among many things, his kind of rap rock production um, yep. style at a certain time. So, but I think this is a really cool um, way, fusion of, of that kind of thing into like the world of Brockhampton. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And the, the impressive thing about it really is that as amazing as it is, as it's easily like a top three beat that I think they've ever worked on, it still doesn't manage to overshadow Joba, who hasn't been on the record that much thus far, uh, which I think is sort of feeds back into my read that a lot of the implied interplay in the verses here is directed towards both him and Kevin. Uh, the subjects of this very song, Joba's verse here is 
nothing short of absolutely astonishing. It is cold in its delivery and it is dark in its content. His words about how he feels trapped and hopeless because of his father's death, which he describes in incredibly graphic detail, it provides an image that is as loud and jarring as the song itself. It's hard not to feel how legitimately tangible his pain is as he's just hopelessly like shouting on here. The strain in his voice and in his delivery implies that he is trying his best and fighting to go on anyway. And my God, it is it is a marvel to witness. It feels less like a verse and more like witnessing a knockdown, drag out gladiatorial fight with Joba's inner demons made manifest. And his attempts to connect to his father in several of these lyrics are just it, 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 these moments of vulnerability and weakness, but it's always immediately followed up by a line about the sheer weight that's been superimposed on him. Hearing him just say things like, I miss you, is enough to bring you to tears, but the sung chorus is what does it for me of, for the record, I can fly around the world absorbing light, something's missing deep inside is just what levels me. Kevin then comes on to do his own verse, matching Joba's energy somehow, talking about his own personal struggles and internal turmoil, acting as sort of a cipher for not just the band, but sort of the state of affairs when it comes to the world. As a Black gay man, it's hard not to feel like there's an inordinate amount of pressure on people like Kevin. He alludes to his own suicidal ideation, talking about seeing the people he loves reflected in the water while looking down from a bridge. Very grim imagery. I think the line that hits the hardest here is something I have not been able to stop thinking about. And if I think about it too hard, I'm going to cry again. And that's, I still struggle telling my mom who I'm in love with. Which, if you followed Kevin's career, seeing him say he was loves his mother and Buzz is actually pretty affirming, seeing as they've had their ups and downs. But even after reconciling with her, he still struggles accepting himself. The song ends with the sound of a baby crying, a brief sonic allusion to one of the themes on New Light, New Machine, uh, which is that of rebirth. Kind of begins here, though. Uh, windows break for a moment with the heavy shit with the uh, holy fuck what a fucking track uh this is six minutes long it's a titan uh it is an ice cold rager it's a fucking huge beat that allows for one of the best brockhampton posse cuts giving literally everybody even fucking bareface a chance to shine the song has a through line theme of being separated from the world, watching it all uh, in it, watching all of its chaos and turmoil play out from behind your own window, giving this song the atmosphere of the members of Brockhampton being inside a limo as they drive through the apocalypse. And uh, for the fucking the acoustic guitars on this track, the blaring synth, they have this woozy combination, uh, but this track is like fucking crack. It is a song of theirs that I think is absolutely quintessential. Dom in particular comes onto this thing with the sole intent to incinerate it. Joba also delivers an incredibly colorful verse showing off how versatile of an artist that he is, sounding totally unlike any other time he's ever dropped a verse. Uh, I deeply relate to the misanthropic refrain of fuck the world and all that inhabit it as a result of looking at everything wrong with the state of affairs. It just really hits home. You also hear sound effects of a character getting into a car and said car driving away in the final segment um, of the track, which frankly makes it feel like this song really does actually take place from inside a vehicle that's gradually like picking up every member of the band to take them somewhere. And seeing as there's been tons of allusions to being in cars and journeys and traveling, I can't help but take note of that, especially in the final lines where a voice says, them boys can go again, the roadrunners, implying that they are walking through this journey or driving through this journey, which is something that I think they build upon. There's I'll Take You On immediately after this. Uh, if some previous songs had interplay between chorus and verses uh, and other members talking to each other, seeing as the previous track was like a communal 
venting of every member, this is the countered response to that in form of a song. Like we had the verses in um, uh, Count On Me, we had the fucking, the verses and the chorus that sort of reflected each other. And now it's being reflected in the two different songs. Um, this is Brockhampton playing very strongly to their boy band-ish tendencies in the strongest way possible. The vocal hooks here are sweeter than honey. Between the verses of reassurance, Joba is reprising a theme from Ginger, open up your heart and I'll give in to you, being a parallel, I think, to if you're hurting, love yourself with my heart. Kevin's verse at the end epitomizes the song's goals as they attempt to literally say goodbye to their struggles and heartbreaks and keep pushing through, as they say, that new light that they are all chasing. Uh, the vocals from Charlie Wilson implemented here are divine, absolutely stellar. Uh, old news. If the previous track was their beginning and attempt to say goodbye to their struggles, this is the process of actually doing so. Matt is lamenting about past relationships. Merlin talks about his own regrets, uh, as does featured artist Baird. Uh, Joba's closing verse here is one of my favorites on the entire album. Uh, wish I knew what it meant when I said I loved you being the first line as if he can only associate past love and positivity with where it ultimately led him, which was heartbreak and tragedy. His following lines uh, feel so earnest, despite being delivered kind of playfully, it's kind of like a coping mechanism. And it delivers the line that for me, anyway, epitomizes the album. We have always talked about the the line, the Brockhampton line on one verse that epitomizes I, I already, these albums. I, I already know what you, you're going to say. <laughs> what a life to lose, beautiful and tragic, just like albums before it. Not to mention the repeated, and I'll, and I'll reprise that later, uh, not to mention the repeated vocal hook of I did this all for you, feels like an expression that's directed towards Joba and Kevin, the main characters of this particular album, which is a strangely, it's a strangely specific phrase I find, as it implies like, you know, I did this all for you. It sounds like they're being thrown a party, which is interesting considering the next song is called What's the Occasion, which is a question one might ask if invited to a surprise party. Weird, huh? It's an absolutely incredible song, just to speak on the actual content of it, with the beat uh, seamlessly blending the guitar and the bass and the repeated hook of what's the occasion and something like a celebration. Perfect responses to the I did this all for you of the previous song and the implication that some sort of celebration is being thrown, a party, like an act of support. Joba in, uh, in this song repeats a million little pieces that all add up to nothing, like an admission of defeat, and immediately following it is a rather frustrated verse from Matt Champion saying things like, I'm tired of wondering what the fuck I gotta do to save you. You've been the shit for years, I can't be your savior, as if he is expressing his hopelessness at trying to help a friend who seems to be in a place where he can't accept said help. Joba's own verse here talks about him being on his own, as if he is refusing help. The end of this song is, to be quite honest, my favorite moment on the entire record. It takes the tone exactly where it needs to go for the next song. It is this crescendo of pure musical euphoria by way of a, it, it's like a black parade style piece of glam rock. It, Pianos also, and- It made mm. me think of the Beatles as well. Yes, a fucking great comp, which, you know, they record in Abbey Road. This makes total sense. Boy band. Huh? But like just the fucking, the pianos, the guitars, it's like a reprisal of San Marcos from Iridescence. And you know that shit's going to get me. And the chorus is repeated. It's so triumphant and sad. And it reads into When I Ball, which is a gorgeous song. It's got this beautiful piano melody and these strings that sound Oh, so sumptuous, my God. Each of the members that aren't Joba or Kevin feed into the theme of rebirth as they drop verses that all correlate to their own births, talking about how they all grew up with the influences of their parents and their relationships with their parents and friends and how it fostered their growth to where they are now and how they want to help foster that new growth now that a rebirth has happened with this band on this album in their friend. 
The end sees Joba spreading his wings, as he said, and saying, you'll always be a part of me, which I think alludes to both the support of his friends that they are trying to give him and that of his departed father because of the themes of parenthood on this track. It's a seamless little bit of theming through reprisal and structure. For a moment, it seems like things might be taking a turn for the better until don't shoot up the party. The notably darker track here is led by Kevin and as he once again embodies some of the more societal and macro themes of the record, something more big, uh, get, getting at some of the more social things that affect the world and affect them, notably issues of race at first. He talks about dealing with homophobia in his own culture, trying to fit in with his peers and his own perceived image as what he thought uh, a man like him was supposed to be like, directly contrasting what we saw in songs like Buzzcut, where embodying the image of a boy band seemed to fly in the face of that. He says that he's telling his story. He's embodied by a new machine, a new classic, as he says, and that his goal is to use it to keep them dancing. Like he's trying to provide fuel for the fire. The title and repeated refrain of Don't Shoot Up the Party feels like it A, reprises the idea that the last few songs uh, on this album are some kind of celebration that they have been led to on a journey. Uh, but also it's, it's got this sort of... Uh, it, it's got this fucking desperate plea to it. it it's yeah. a huge rager, but it's also like a, he, he's saying, please, he's saying, don't shoot up the party. Don't shoot up the party, please. And it, it's Kevin pleading for the obstacles that the band has been talking about facing this whole time to not ruin or shoot up the party he's creating with this music. It's a direct reference to gun violence further tying it in with Kevin's observations of America throughout the album. And it's an act of denial. It's trying to continue this party while constantly afraid and living in fear that it will suddenly be brought to an end. The blaring G-funk synth and eventual use of the gunshot remind me of who else but Kendrick Lamar, specifically on his song King Kunta, where this exact device is employed to suit its own thematic thing, which I can't believe is uh, not a coincidence. It's, it's, oh, it's simply totally. too close. It's to a degree where it's undeniable. And I think that just like that song, this absolutely fucking knocks. But gun usage implies that Kevin's illusion, so to speak, of the party is broken. This is the last vestige of denial. Joba does not get to sail into the sunset and neither does Kevin. And th that's the dark reality that ends this song. It's them putting up a facade and that facade failing after that gunshot hits, which leads us into Dear Lord and The Light Part 2. Dear Lord is a very spacey, minimal track that is just Bare faces vocals, and it talks more about that interplay that I have been hinting at, where the bandmates are talking to each other. And Bareface is speaking to God as a cipher to Joba, saying that they want that he wants uh, him to pick him up, to tell him to fight, to tell him to keep going, because obviously he's still looking for that light. He's just not been able to find it yet. And it's like the, the, the way that this comes after the boisterous don't shoot up the party, it, it's chilling, but it's touching. It's this weird emotional flux. It's the simplest song they've ever made because it's one thing. And yet it's like function within here is just so expert. And that goes into the light part two, which is maybe the best lyricism showcased on a Brockhampton project thus far. And I don't know, guys, this is a, this verse is a lot. It's, it's a lot, a lot. Um, it starts uh, with Joba, just sort of, you know, it's got that sort of gradual buildup and um, I guess I should just preface this because we haven't really gone into detail about it. Um, I can't listen to this song without like weeping. Like it's not just crying or getting sad or feeling misty eyed like I might with a song like Tanya. No, I mean, I've like, when I drove to get my vaccine and listened to this on the way home, I broke down in tears and had to stop my car at a gas station. It's potent, incredibly potent from the outset. The chorus itself, the light is worth the wait, I promise. Wait, why did you do it? 
the white is worth the wait, screaming, please don't do it. And, you know, doesn't take a genius to figure out who he's talking to and what he's talking about. And yeah, that's not even the hard part, but that refrain still has stuck in my mind of just wait, please don't do it. Then you have Kevin showing up, expressing a lot of his frustration just with the world saying that, you know, people are giving him false info and lies like he didn't grow up on subcultures and being fed things that were innately linked to black culture in America, that's their identity was basically built entirely off of, you know, cutting the bullshit and being honest and not having to fucking deal with the internalized racism that's everywhere. He, he just, like, he, this is him. He's been dealing with this and he feels coddled. He, he has, says he has bruises uh, and these things led him to being confident because he has been hurt because he was able to get through it. He talks about his cousin's death. He talks about, throughout the album too, he talks about the fact that he was thrust into fame before he was even really able to figure out who he was, which is an incredibly difficult concept to take on, especially in an age where we are all so terminally fucking online and broadcasting ourselves to everyone in the world. And he's talking about seeing his city up in flames. He's talking about protests and how he's, you know, he's driving with his boyfriend and he takes solace in the fact that his boyfriend is white so that a cop won't shoot him if he's driving the car that they're in. And it's, it's just so earnest and it's such a blanketly vulnerable expression of frustration of what it is like to be alive right now and fucking fixed inside this minority group that is being shoveled with mountains of bullshit and he's just telling them to see the light and it doesn't really it leaves off on sort of an a cliffhanger i guess of just like will they be able to who knows but it's Joba who steals the show here. Uh, I, I cannot think of a more arresting way to begin a verse than when the hammer pulled back, did you think of me? I can't read the rest of this verse simply because it is so forwardly emotional and it's so difficult to hear Joba who on a song that they had released a long time ago talked about how he was proud of himself for not settling down and having children like his contemporaries did and pursuing his artistic passion. And now he's here on a song pleading to ask why his father killed himself and saying that he wants to tell his future children how cool their grandfather was. And also reconciling the fact that his relationship with his father was in fact inherently very complicated, that they had butted heads, that he had a, a difficult time with him, that he hasn't been reconciled yet and will never get to be reconciled because of this. And it's, ah, uh, it's, to call it powerful doesn't do it justice simply. I, I think it's, it's one of the most moving things I've experienced in music and some time and I, I value it deeply just because of how much vulnerability and strength that it would take to do this. And I, <sighs> impermanence turned permanent with a nine, that's life. Ending a record on that, I, oh fuck. What a way to go out. And then it just sort of fades out. And, you know, I, I said earlier that, you know, it's like the line that epitomized Ginger, if you're hurting, love yourself with my heart. That the line that epitomizes iridescence was private plane still crash. Then Roadrunner is what a life to lose. It is about figuring out all of the things that help you be guided towards the light. And that's why this album manages to contain this dark emotional content while also being a raucously fun endeavor that just it, it's fist pumping this is a fun album it's so fun to listen to and I I have a great time with it it brings me so much joy and that feels like an act of defiance it feels powerful in and of itself just as a proclamation what a life to lose indeed Roadrunner if it is anything is a desperate aching plea to not give up 
not just because something might be worth it, but because something is worth it. And that thing is the music they make. It is the friends they have. As saccharine as it is, it is all about the friends we made along the way. It's so odd to say this about such a boisterous up-tempo record, but the context matters. Brockhampton making an album like this in and of itself is moving. They finally get to shine as artists without baggage that they walked away from on Ginger finally. They're growing. They've done uh, so much as musicians and lyricists and it's so evident how much they've how far they've come and Roadrunner is that victory lap it's the first uh it, it's what the first, first post-saturation album was supposed to be but it is a rejection of the notion that they have to be tied to their image to create something emotionally evocative it is a declaration of preservation it says after the last two albums we almost fell apart both as a band and as people but we didn't so let's fucking celebrate and but they were never going to do just that. There was always going to be more to it. Out of the fog of war that encompasses a year like 2020, a difficult year for everybody that wasn't a white millionaire, Brockhampton took an approach not to soak themselves in misery, but to defiantly embrace not their weakness, but their strength. Though a new, exciting, invigorating sound and energy and party-like atmosphere that they haven't had since their early days, it just fits. Every sound is like they have something to prove. Everyone is hungry on Roadrunner. Verses are energetic and fiery and dense. And it's an album that feels like it was, wasn't was born from necessity, but passion first and foremost, which as a longtime fan, this is the final form of Brockhampton. This is immensely gratifying. This is the album that we, I, lots of people I think have waited for since they told us what their potential was. And this is an album that does sound like it was worked on for those continuous months, those almost a year's worth of work. And as a result, it contains a vital immediacy that they've never had. As Joba says, the past does not define you. And like, how does something like this exist and manage to accomplish its goals? How does it not compromise itself? I don't know how but I am infinitely thankful for its existence because it has made me happier than any piece of music has in quite some time. And even in introspective moments, I find myself finding value in them. I see, I hear things like, the light is worth the wait. Please don't do it. The light's worth the wait. And I just think, God, there are people in my life I really wish I got to tell that to. But I have those people. And I am thankful. And that's what this album is about. So let's have a fucking party. Beautifully said. Yeah. Uh, on the note of this kind of, we've mentioned a couple of times or multiple times now that how much, how much fun this album is, how, well, the party it is. In fact, party is the thing that you kind of leaked off from uh, when you kind of started from what I said. And so I think one of the things that makes this record so much fun and one of the things that makes the funness of this record so potent is the fact that it's fun directly in the face of the darkness like that that's that you that you can make a record that's purely happy and purely gleeful and purely uh entertaining but what makes those qualities of this record so much more impactful and meaningful is the fact that they're right there next to that really heavy shit and they're there in the face of it and they're there both as a rebuttal to it but also as a way of accepting it even though that's a contradiction yes um and that's, so I think but what that's makes, what it's about. It's about the contradiction. Yeah. You said it. I think that's, what makes, it. That, that's what make, makes it so uh, meaningful. A couple of other things. Uh, the line you uh, noted about um, what a life to lose, beautiful and tragic, is definitely a key line in the record. I actually thought mm -hmm. you were going to mention the very next line after it, which is pleasure and pain both remain, which I also think that is a, continuation but yes yeah I agree. They're, they're the same idea really but i like that pleasure and pain both remain and i also the way that joba follows that up with i was amazed and amazed with you that's what i meant not what i said to if you only mm -hmm. knew so that's a kind of idea about um being able to wistfully look back and think about how you would have done things better what you wish you had said and then eventually the rest of the record um by the time it reaches its conclusion it kind of makes peace in a certain way it's not yeah. like a a full sense of closure by the end of the record i think ending on a repetition of that chorus rather than 
the end of Joba's final verse is pointed in the sense that it's not a record that's fully about peace. It's a record about, you know, the, the need to hold on to the possibility of peace and, and um, the, in your darkest moments. Uh, the it's, light is worth... It, thematically speaking, you know what it's like, don't you? Yeah. The light is worth the wait is obviously, yes, both a plea from Joba um, retrospectively to his father, but also just this general um, truism that they wish to get into the world, that something that they wish to sink into people's heads as they take away from this record, that that um, there is inevitably going to be something beautiful that will emerge if you are able to um, hold on and make it through the darkness. But also like um it, it directly it's like you know the light is in heaven is worth the wait as in staying alive you know what i mean like it's both a figurative image and a very kind of real thing like there's so much on this record that works in that way where it's like multiple different meanings that yep. are all kind of linked can be taken away from the same thing another thing in that vein i wanted to mention is um on the note of don't shoot up the party I talked a little bit about the song before. Um, I think there's a, a, some more uh, ways of interpreting it have even kind of a, a come into my brain since I initially talked about it. Um, so yeah, there's this notion of um, this record is this gigantic celebration of life and, and a kind of renewed sense of energy and purpose and, and a shedding of past um, baggage. Um, and, but it's also like, you know, the constant awareness of the fact that this is also fragile and, and we don't, we want to be able to stay in this moment, as you said. Um, but I, you can also read it as kind of like, a, <laughs> in many ways, don't shoot up the party. It's kind of like uh, emblematic of my mentality going into this record for the first time. Because like we all wanted this yeah. Rockhampton to finally be kind of free of their baggage. And we were all kind of like hoping that that wouldn't taint this record and somehow that, that they wouldn't shoot up their own party. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that it's meaningful that this song comes at the point it does on the record at which immediately after it, um, the party is shot up both figurative, figuratively and yes. literally um, in ways. And, and maybe the maybe that's a little bit too on the nose, but I, I think that uh, it's, a re again, really uh, emblematic of the great bit of sequencing that that song is on the record. Um, uh, a couple other things I wanted to mention as well. Um, something that uh, on the note of Dear Lord as well, yes, Bareface leads this track, but I think it's also worth noting that there he is supported by backing vocalists. I believe one of them, I've read somewhere that one of them was actually Sean Mendes as well, but there's basically oh. like a bed of vocals that come to harmonize with Bareface on this track. I think that's a cool and important aspect of it as well, because it's about, it's both the plea from one man to his friend, but also like the communal wave of support yeah. as well of, of, of everyone, which is what makes that track so powerful. Um, another thing I wanted to mention as well, um, uh, on, the tr on the note of the track, Old News, let me get it up. Um, you gave a really nice, I like the way that your inter interpretation of this kind of sequence of tracks and, and the, through the record kind of flew, flowed from one song to the next uh, but one the original way that I read this song um, I think your interpretation is probably more fitting but I also read the song a little bit as kind of a meta song on um, fans expectations um, it's particularly the hook and particularly Matt's verse where he's like I wish it didn't end like this you stopped loving me a long time ago I didn't notice <laughs> caught a new wave couldn't contain how I feel about it easy to say I'm to blame I, I, I'm definitely reading that in a very meta way but I also, I, but I think that there's to a certain extent, um, Brockhampton are always kind of conscious of um, their restlessness as artists, their des continuous desire to uh, push and their sound and their subject matter and their style and the effect that that has on um, their listeners in an era that is very clearly defined by um, artists being able to be pigeonholed in very specific ways. Um, by algorithms and stuff like that. And Brock Brockhampton are kind of an anti-algorithm band, an anti-Spotify band in certain senses. And so I feel like they, in some way, even if it's just implicitly, are kind of comment on, commenting on that when they, whenever they sing about um, change or development or, or being different. Um, so that was just another additional thing. Uh, and also, uh, I, I wondered if you were going to shout it out, but you didn't. So it, may, it gives me an opportunity to shout out um, maybe one of the coolest lines on the record I think which is uh in Dom's verse in Windows when he says uh my pen could be a fortune teller or an ATM <laughs> which I think is such a cool line Fucking 
that uh, heat which it's also the first line in his verse as well and i think that's a cool aspect of of dom's character on this record that we haven't necessarily touched on as much yet dom's whole um approach to this record and style on this record where it's kind of uh he's always kind of been very introspective and kind of talking about his artistic place and his personal place and the way that his art reflects his personal life and all that sort of stuff but I think he has some really uh, interesting and pointed moments on this record like that, where he reflects on his place in Brockhampton, his um, identity as an artist. Um, and uh, again, that identity thing also kind of touches on the discussion of, of influences in black culture and chain on that we also already talked about. Um, but anyway, they could fucking write a thesis on this fucking band. So I'll, well, I'll stop there. I mean, that just kind of goes in, inherent with it. And like, just... <sighs> I know that with an, a band like this, who's previously been very emotionally evocative and who releases an album, it's very emotionally evocative and very emotionally evocative to some of the things that we have experienced with, it's kind of heavy. So, you know, you have that sort of thing and people be like, eh, I bet they're gonna get kind of emotional on this. It's just like, this is, if I had to put succinctly why this album has grown to, why I just love it so much. It's that I didn't mean to have the car ride with Iridescence, that I didn't mean to have the summer with Sersha Davy and Morgan with Ginger. I didn't need a memory or, or trauma or pain or blah, blah. I, I didn't need any of that shit. I just got to love some fucking music finally. And it felt good and I got to experience it with my friends and we all had a good time and I got to experience the rollout and it was great and it's like I know it evokes all of these sad things and it does it really really well and it shouldn't be discounted but and you know and I'm gonna get all saccharine and sentimental blah 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 blah. but it's the the reason is just because it, it makes me happy it makes other people happy that's yeah. why it's good that's why it means a lot um one more beautifully said one more thing i'll say before i shut up on the note of um because i talked a little bit briefly before about how brockhampton have always been kind of like pushing forward their sound and trying to you know uh, evolve their style and never be kind of static as artists but also at the same time trying to uh, capture and call back to certain energies and and bring certain energies from the past into the future and I think a way in which this record does that that is kind of like a perfect emblematic representation of that is that there are multiple points on this record where Bleach from Saturation 3 is sampled in the beats yeah. of these songs uh, mm -hmm. notably the main loop on Buzzcut is actually made directly from a sample of Bleach um, and what's I think notable about that particular song being used is that that's um, some of you may or may not know this. Obviously, the big Brockhampton fans will know this, but that's basically before um, when the saturation truly was all said and done. That song, I think, was the song I heard most people saying was kind of their favorite Brockhampton song. That song was like a really legendary one. Um, and so I think it's kind of meaningful to take something that represents uh, something that fans hold really, really near and dear to their heart, like the most quintessential classic saturation era Brockhampton song debatably obviously there's a bunch of picks but they chose that one to infuse into this record and also they have like moments of this record where that um tape rewinding sample that's in the saturation records as well as is, is incorporated here as well as a bit of throwback too um and also another way in which they've kind of in which uh they've tried to i think make this they've tried to even incorporate elements of ginger which at this juncture in their career seems like maybe the most on its own album they've ever made is like the song I'll Take You On. To me, the first time I heard that, I was like, oh, this is like the title track on Ginger, except like happy <laughs> and like big mm -hmm. and, and like like uh, blown up into like IMAX scale, basically. And so that's basically a, a good way of microcosming this is it's like dragging little bits of the past uh, into the future, infusing them with new sounds and then blowing the scale up to a million times. Um, and, and yeah, all I have to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, this record, the point where I'm at now is it's like I feel about this record like I did Punisher last year. Like, that's where I'm at with it now. Um, it, it's well, my, well, what could that possibly be like? No idea. Um, it's my favorite Brockhampton record. It, it's one of my favorite, it's my favorite record of the year thus far. Um, and I don't see anything beating it. Um, and and uh, 
the specifics has already been gone into. So just I'll, I'll talk about sort of the broad strokes and try to paint a portrait of my relationship with this record, I guess. Um, and, and, I, and I'll talk about the cover art for a start because, you know, widely ridiculed cover art because it looks weird. Um, but I, I kind of got what they were going for when that came out. Well, I, um, I just want to say like the cover art, I, I think most people would agree the cover art is great, but the decision to make the cover a picture of the cover art on a CD with a white surround yeah. is, is the thing that really doesn't work just, at all. Just, just make it this. Yeah, just exactly. Just make it this. Exactly. M maybe it was kind of like Brockhampton trying to like subtly oh, say, buy, phys buy physical copies of our records, you cowards. Um, <laughs> I did. But it's Maybe so they should put it on vinyl. Possibly a Kanye illusion. The, oh, um, yeah, yeah. Apparently, uh, just, yeah, out. yeah, yeah. I was going to say they did say in an interview they were working on getting vinyl out, but it was purely because of COVID that makes vinyl really difficult to press at the moment for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah. but well, um, fucking remove that I said that then. <laughs> <laughs> what what I love about that cover art is um, the band have talked about the fact that this album is sort of meant to feel like pure freedom in their own words um and and i kind of got that was a vibe they were going for the moment joba started full settling in the buzz cut music video when that dropped uh because just him saying um doing that amazing falsetto with the wind blowing in his long hair and he doesn't give a shit he's just living life um i was immediately like right that's the vibe and I want it, and that's what it was. Um, this is a record that feels like the wind in your hair. Um, it's a record that feels like breaking through, I guess. Um, and in a way, this is why I, I do kind of feel like my relation to this record is indebted to, it, it is still kind of indebted to the drama and the band in a way, because yeah, this is the album about dropping all that baggage but at the same time, it works because it feels like they have left behind all of that shit. Now they just get to enjoy being a band. So much of what I like about Brockhampton actually reminds me a lot of what I like about this podcast in many ways, where it's just like a group of friends with very disparate um, areas of focus, I guess, coming in to do this thing together. It has this weird chaotic energy that somehow works. Um, and... Yeah, so when I listen to this album that I know I'm going to be reviewing in a week and they have that amazing level of teamwork, it just makes me feel so, like, full of pride in a way, you know? This is the band just getting to make the record they wanted to make. Um, and it's such a satisfying arrival for the band. Um, and I love it. Oh, yeah. Mm. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, who, we, we <laughs> who wants to go next? <laughs> August, you go. I nominate okay. you. Okay, I was gonna go. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, record open strong with uh, buzz cut. Uh, I think Kevin's hook is a really immediately satisfying gateway to this album, and Danny Brown is really fun on here too. Buzzcut, just a superb opener to the LP, uh, gets you in the mood, great mood setter, littered with hooks throughout, almost the record in a microcosm in a sense. Although it is a bit emblematic of an issue I had with these first four songs in particular, in that I think the guests on here tend to steal the show a little too much away from the Hamptons themselves. And... <laughs> <laughs> the Hamptons. Mr. Hampton, this is, this is a it reminds me of when I talked about an Andrew Jackson year hard film and I said Mr. Jackson's record um, <laughs> yeah. he's just Mr. Hampton but yeah uh, I, I did think these spe it was specifically only really an issue on these first four tracks where I felt the guests took a little too much away from the main cast of the group although then uh and it, it does kind of lead me to think that this this early part is maybe a little 
lacking in the personality that the band so often has, but that's more than made up for in my eyes in the following nine tracks. Uh, yeah, my hesitation to kind of get fully on board with the record is of course Shattered by the Light, which is a beautiful track. I almost wish it was the opener, honestly, because I think it would just be such a m more powerful structural choice to open on part one and close on part two. Uh, although I do love the guitar driven parts on this album, I think they're, they bring a real swagger and atmosphere to this album. And particularly when this album experiments with, you know, instrumentation that is not traditionally associated with hip hop, I think it's a I think it makes for really interesting instrumental palettes. Heck, I mean, even the sampling of their own song, I think, makes for really interesting and intricately crafted moments. And yeah, the way Joba and Kevin play off of each other here is, is so great. And this idea that uh, Jake bringing of members really playing off each other was something I, I observed and really dug about this record that everyone is able to kind of have this communication network with each other almost. And then we've got, for me, what is the best track on here? Uh, Windows. I love the posse cuts in Brockhampton's discography. Windows has this real, yeah. is this real interesting kind of subversion of a lot of typical hip hop bra bravado taken through the lens of this kind of pushing away one's emotional problems through a window. Like as Jake met, made the uh, point of this kind of uh, living life kind of trapped in your own bubble with your problems, kind of leaving your problems on the outside and not, not letting that in kind of, uh, I don't know, it's a, tougher concept to convey but jake did it well already so shut up and move on uh and yeah i i do love the way this record can bounce around from style to style with later tracks like don't shoot up the party being dark consistently dark in its subject matter and not as atmospheric as a track like windows is able to be a much more bouncy cut on the same record i love this kind of I love the way they're able to shift their style throughout this record in a, in a way that feels very natural and very satisfying. So yeah, I think this album's more haunting production is what tends to be my favorite stuff on here, which is not to detract from the more bouncy material like Don't Shoot Up the Party, which while still dark in its lyricism, not quite as atmospheric and spacious in its production, but still lots of fun. Uh, fun being a relative term here. Uh, one thing I do have to mention that consistently detracted from my uh, experience was the addition of Jabari Manwa on vocal duties. I found he mostly sings hooks like on tracks like Old News and I find the way his voice is produced it feels very generic and flavorless to me. And it feels a little, uh, and it and to me it feels just very out of place. When at this point everyone else in the band has so, so well developed their own distinct style, uh, but Joba though is a runaway highlight on this album for very obvious reasons, uh, namely light the light part one and two and a lot of his other verses on here. Dear Lord, uh, while not an amazing track, is this kind of gospel choir that maybe not the most inventive or creative thing on here, but I can forgive it because it serves as a more transitional moment into The Light Part Two, which is a very high note to end on, this very emotional closer with lines, of, with uh, just Joba's description of his father's suicide being a particularly rough thing to listen to. It is gut wrench. It is soul rendingly grief stricken. It's one of the most beautiful depictions I've heard of a person having to describe their own father's suicide. It, it's a very powerful moment on the record. And I, I have to give him 
some major props for being able to hold this off. And it almost feels like he he's breaking down as he's singing his verse, especially in that final part where he says that's life. It sounds like he could just, yep. he was going to cry right as he finished that verse. It's a, it's a moment that made me tear up a little myself just mm-hmm. in how great of an impact it, it left. But yeah, uh, Roadrunner as a whole, I enjoy it. I think it's about of of my kind of the Brockhampton albums. It stands as a higher point in their catalog, but for me, still a bit mixed as a whole. And I'm not I'm not totally in love with it. But I think the great tracks on here and the best moments on here are in the top one percent of everything they've ever done. Yeah. I think on the note of um, the light part two as well, just thinking on it some more, um, what makes, because like anyone can kind of speak about something really uh, horrible and and that affected them and some kind of trauma, some kind of grief or whatever. Anyone can speak on that if they've experienced it. But I think it takes more than just speaking on it to really have the emotional effect that Joba has on the song. Uh, especially because you also run the risk of coming across as uh, emotionally exploitative, even though it's your own grief. Like there, there is a, a possibility of that, that I think Joba circumvents. And one of the things that makes his verse so, or both on the light part two and the light part one, so um, great and so like affecting, one of the things that makes it so hard hitting and a quality that we've all kind of touched on with this song is like uh, anyone who's experienced a kind of acute grief like that will know that in the wake of that, uh, everything becomes, all of your thoughts and your sensory experiences and everything becomes heightened in a way that is really uh, disorienting and and like makes the pain much more acute. And, and I think what Joba channels and his verse is he really manages to channel through words that sense of heightened, of being in a heightened state, like your everything being turned up to 11. You're f- constantly unable to get away from certain images related to the event, um, certain immediate visceral responses. You're completely in a state of heightened awareness and heightened uh, everything. And that's something that I think makes records like, for instance, the A Crow Looked at Me by Mount Erie, so captivating as well, even as as works of art, as opposed to just outpourings of grief, is the ways in which they channel that sense of uh, heightened uh, emotional and psychological and mental and and even physical state that you experience when you're having an acute um, response to grief. Um, So yeah, props to Joba for um, being able to channel that and put it all into two verses that feel uh necessary and not just cheap for for lack of a better word uh really impressive stuff morgan well i don't have much to add uh we've said a lot of things in this segment a great many of them I agree with. Um, I certainly wanna, wouldn't want to belabor any points. So just broad strokes here. I, too, love the album to the surprise of, uh, yeah, let's see, fucking no one. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, very stellar. I think it's their most consistent yet. Um, if I were to note any drawbacks... I would just say for like uh, the hmm, best way to phrase this. Okay, yeah. So it's like we've often remarked that uh, there will probably never be a perfect Brock Hampton album. Um, and that remains the same here, but you know, it's a feature, not a bug. Um, and it kind of this the uh, in this point it embodies itself in uh, this album just being like way back loaded 
in my opinion. Not to say that the first four tracks in, in particular are bad in any way. They aren't at all. Um, it's just there's a distracting shift in both quality and tone that happens when the light starts compared to the first four tracks that's like initially kind of misleading to the sound of the album and the tone it will have and and while that's not necessarily a drawback just because the songs fucking knock um it, it can be a little a, a little bit a little bit of whiplash is possible but to that end it very much is just a perfect album from then on I just want to say that Windows, to me, while I might, might like some Brockhampton songs more than it at this point, I think it is the Brockhampton song at yes. this point. Um, obviously, it's a posse cut, so that auto- automatically gets it up there in that sense. But like, it just if, if somebody wanted to know what Brockhampton was about, I would play them Windows probably first thing. Shit hits in the here. whip, my guy. What the fuck? Favorite tracks and ratings. <laughs> Favorite tracks and ratings for for Roadrunner, New Light, New Machine. Jake. Uh, favorite tracks. I'm going. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Fuck it. Might as well be honest. The light part two. The light and motherfucking windows <laughs> don't laugh at me motherfucker uh least favorite song um it's a song i really love but you know i, I will say that bankroll is the song that i think is the is the the, the weakest but like cool over count on me fuck man <laughs> dude dude count on me has the hook like the hook yeah no, bankroll sure. has the beat but it does not have the hook yeah I will, I, will con- I will concede that bank route isn't exactly as compelling as the hook on Kevin. Bank route. <laughs> but I mean, no who gives a man. shit because this record is a damn... Yes. It Back looks like an 01. Oh, there we there go. There you go. There it is. <laughs> Only you had a... If only you had a pillow in which to display your rating. Oh, fucking if only. It would be really cool if it was sequined and I could do it for each thing. God, that would be a cool bit. And favorite tracks are, uh, I'd say, The Light Part 2, Windows, Don't Shoot Up the Party, Least Favorite is Count on Me, I'd give it a 6. Oh. Uh, what are your favorite tracks, Morgan? Yeah. Maybe I'll fucking say it. Um, <laughs> my three favorites Maybe. are... Oh, our windows. Uh, I'll go when I ball, and the light part two. Not necessarily in that order, but let me. F- <clears throat> um, least favorite. Uh, hmm. I'll go with a uh, chain on with the disclaimer that JPEG Mafia and Dom's verses fucking rip. Uh, but. I feel like Kevin's hook on that song. I feel like he just kind of he just kind of sounds bored, and I'm not crazy <laughs> about it. But you know, these melodies need Duolingo. Yeah, it's, it's it's far from a bad song. Morgan putting uh, it, Morgan talking shit on the hook because Kevin says the N word over and over, so Morgan can't sing it. And <laughs> that's not, what is this a Fantano comment section? <laughs> Yes, that's that's not why. <laughs> Fucking nailed it. <laughs> see, see, al- see. Also, every contribution from so gone, so flexy on this record. <laughs> <laughs> Which, are, incidentally, we never really talked about him, but his verses are good. His verses are really good. His verses are great. His rap name is terrible, but that's beside the point. Um, can I rate Mister So Flexy? Are you fuckers no. done slandering me so I can rate this record now? <laughs> okay, it's a nine and a half out of ten. <laughs> you oh dear. Motherfuckers. So my favorite tracks are off the top of my head. Lights parts one and two. Uh, don't shoot up the party. My least favorite track is Chinese Satellite, and it's getting a ten. Okay, my three favorite tracks Damn. are The Light. 
Uh, we don't shoot up the party and win I ball. Uh, least favorite track is count on me and uh, impermanence turn permanent with a nine. God damn it. <laughs> yes. What? Son of a yes. bitch. So yes. Has a, despite, Thank you. Despite no one giving this album a rating as low as August on Punisher, it has a lower average. Um, that being 8.9 out of 10. Uh, 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 other records to have 8.9 out of 10 include uh, D. Laus in the Comitorium, Exile in Guyville, and um, Around the Fur. Damn, all of those just stabs August I, in the heart. Um, <laughs> I was, my, my heart was racing before Tyler said his rating because if this was a 9.0, I would be very disappointed. <laughs> it didn't do it for oh, you. you fuck is that? It didn't you do it for you, man. you little shit. No, I know you didn't. What are you? I know you about? didn't. He, he's allowed to be disappointed. Yeah, fair enough. Um, about what? <laughs> I'm not disappointed about anything. I'm pleased. Okay. Guilty, so please. you all heard him say disappointed, right? Disapp- what? Yeah, and I said he was. Allowed. Yeah. Fucking Riley Walker. Why? Okay. So I was about to say um, before Whatever. we get into the next record, I was about to say that um, let me just check something. So this uh, our, our overall average score is eight point nine, as Josh said. Our standard deviation is one point six seven three, which makes it the twenty um, fifth highest standard deviation of anything we've reviewed, um, and put it, puts it just ahead in standard deviation of Playboy Cardi's whole lot of red. <laughs> Fuck me. <laughs> I, uh... Which, you know, it's not a rating, it's standard deviation. So that's, yeah. so that, that, that's, that's really funny, I think. Um, anyway, speaking of albums I suspect will have a reasonably high standard deviation. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, now it's time to move on to our second main review of the day, which is going to be a much more low-key affair, I, I suspect, which is probably for the better, considering the whirlwind we just went through. Our second album that we're reviewing today is So, who is this dude? And why are we fucking gay? Why are we reviewing his albums? Riley Walker, um, the way in which I became aware of, aware of Riley is that um, the first way I became aware of Riley is that he initially got retweeted onto my feed uh, at some point last year, early last year, by Jason Isbell, who is a big fan oh. of Riley. Um, and so yeah, I, became, yeah, I became aware of Riley um, because uh, he's quite a funny Twitter personality. Um, it's not necessarily been as visible lately because he's been so busy promoting this record um but he's a really he's a really funny dude on twitter and i always just thought of him as this really awesome poster and then i be- i wasn't even initially aware that he made music but riley's actually had a short um a reasonably short music career but a quite a prolific one having released either as a solo project or in collaboration with other artists as many as 10 different records in the span of the last seven years um, Course in Fable, however, is Riley's most focused and ambitious effort yet, I think. It, it showcases a shift uh, in sound for him somewhat um, and a renewed sense of, of purpose. It feels very much like a record he's been building towards in a lot of ways. Um, Riley, for those who don't know, primarily operates within the realm of alternative and psychedelic influenced folk music. Uh, and this new record, I think, is a stellar showcase for what makes him such an original, progressive, and musically fascinating artist. Um, it's not necessarily a record that um, uh, will is like hugely attention grabbing in a lot of ways. I suspect it will be uh, reasonably divisive in our discussion, at least, because of that simple nature of it. Um, but I think that I, I'm hoping to be able to give a reasonably good and strong explanation of why I think there's a lot going on here that is impressive and just from a purely musical standpoint as divorcing myself as much from subjective taste as possible although obviously I can't do that completely but in a lot of ways what Riley does on this record is just very technically and musically impressive 
Uh, it's notably a record made with heavy collaboration from John McIntyre, who is a legendary mu musician known primarily for his work in the seminal post-rock band Tortoise, and his touches on both the mix and production of this record, as well as the instrumental con contributions he brings to it, playing synthesizer, key keyboards, and vibraphone. Uh, contribute heavily to the feel and movement of the album. In many ways, this record does have a lot in common with some of those 90s Tortoise records uh, and both feel, because that Tortoise were a band that kind of made post-rock, but not post-rock in the Godspeed, you Black Emperor sense, post-rock in the Talk Talk sense. Uh, post-rock that, that was heavily influenced by jazz and um, chamber music and pop music as well to a certain extent, stuff that was really kind of deconstructive and, uh, and also progressive as well. Um, and that feel I think is, is, is imbued in this record as well, even though this is much more folk oriented, um, despite having that tinge to it. Um, and this is also a very different kind of record to the sort of thing that we normally cover on this podcast. Uh, we don't necessarily normally talk about these kinds of weird, wrinkly records where the focus is really heavily on the actual musicality of it. Uh, we often talk, we often tend to be gravitated more to discussions that talk more about a record's context or a record's uh, subject matter or some kind of meat in that respect. Whereas I think everything that is most interesting about this record is purely musical, which may be a critic, which could be a valid criticism to have as well. There's not, um, and I'll get onto Riley's lyricism and style uh, of writing in a minute. Um, it's musically dense, but fascinating. Uh, it is also a fusion of classic sort of progressive rock stylings with, as I've spoken on, a heavy jazz influence, um, specifically in the way that uh, the songs are arranged and also the way the different chord changes on basically every song here are very kind of unconventional and jazzy. Um, but also, this is also influenced by, I think, the guitar-based experimental music of artists like Jim O'Rourke and any number of kind of avant folk or even slowcore folk artists like Songs Ohio to a certain extent that were burgeoning in the late 90s and 2000s. This is an absolute melting pot of different sounds that I think coalesce in very interesting ways that I can definitely see perhaps leaving some people feeling cold. But for me, I find absolutely fascinating. And not just like, I think this record's interesting in an intellectual way and, and nothing else. I, I find this record really pleasing to listen to and really uh, exciting at certain points as well. And I find the changes within certain tracks to be really uh, adventurous. Um, but there's really so much to dig into here. Um, the opening track, uh, Striking Down Your Big Premiere, uh, immediately kind of brings the record into focus with this declarative melodic buzz. It has a really unusual kind of walking bass line and drum pattern that's strange before it eventually kind of settles into this really straightforward ascending descending loop during its main section. And then you have Riley's elliptical and heavily poetic lyricism taking center stage. Uh, I, I find Riley's writing style to be primarily evocative um, more than uh, directly meaningful. I think in many respects he channels Dylan in his style in certain respects as well and amal in the way that he is this amalgam of um, striking imagery uh, that is kind of difficult to pass but also is weaved together with a lot of poetic flair. Uh, and, and I think it's really all on display in this first track but I think that the record even gets better from here. Uh, Rang Dizzy is a great song. I love the way that the strings in this track weave in and out of the melody, which is actually driven primarily by Riley's voice, which sets a bedrock for the bass and the looping guitar. Uh, I could see Riley's voice potentially being something that some people find not particularly engaging. He has a kind of muted style, but I think he's quite tuneful as well. And there's actually, I think, a real, the way that he uses his voice in a particularly subtle way, I think is, is appropriate for the material. And I'll get to that later on in my review. Um, he has some really striking lines uh, in this track. I am wise, I'm so fried, rain dizzy inside, fuck me in the light. Um, there's, this song has a really great instrumental passage where the strings and the guitar are kind of ascending together and they're doing this really unconventional melody in each of the audio channels uh, in sync with each other. I love it. Uh, and that's really, I think, pure uh, John McIntyre and a pure sense of that um, post-rock influence to a certain extent. Uh, I find this track to be so warm and delightful. Uh, I've played it an awful lot uh, this last week. 
Um, but my favorite song here, and I also would not be surprised to hear if it's the most divisive one because it's also the longest song here, but I really love the track A Lenticular Slap. I think it's um, the most musically impressive uh, song on the record. And I think the one that best showcases where Riley is at and what makes him unique as a musician. The track opens with uh, various looping passages that kind of interweave in this way that shouldn't really feel as fluid as it does, but how I would describe it is kind of like composed jamming. It has the feel of a jam, but it's also got the same feel of being very heavily orchestrated and planned. Like they have recorded a jam session and then they have played it back to themselves and rehearsed the jam and then recorded it again as this more composed thing. It's a really interesting uh, style of playing. It's all very jazzy. Uh, it's very minimal and unshowy. Um, it's like, yeah, you expect from a, a record that's ostensibly folk music, you expect these melodies to jump out of you and you expect there to be a real harshness and a real viscerality to it. But this record does not have it. Again, it's very kind of jazzy in its approach. Uh, from a musical perspective, it's less... Um, it's less uh, attention grabbing, but it is uh, more gorgeous and um, I think uh, ages better as a result. Uh, Riley and his band have lots of really uh, interesting and unconventional chord progressions in this track too. I really love um, when uh, artists can pull off really unconventional chord progressions and chord changes without making it seem like they're just being random. Uh, I don't think I don't even get that impression of randomness from this record. I get a real sense of composure that I think uh, is really accomplished. But at the same time, it doesn't feel like, or to me at least, maybe you'll disagree. It doesn't feel like Riley is kind of flaunting his unusual songwriting or musician style. It just feels like he's trying to take the seeds of of a good song and then use those seeds in a way that's unconventional but rewarding. Uh, and, and for me, I think he pulls it off. Um, it's definitely a style I can understand feeling distance from. Uh, Riley, I think, is a compelling vocal presence, as I said, with a really nice voice, but he is deliberately low key in a lot of his vocal deliveries, so as not to disrupt or take away from the flow and mix of instrumentation here, which deservingly takes center stage. This is quite an instrumentally dense record. Um, as I'll touch on in a, in a minute, there are two guitarists on this record, a bass player, a drummer, um, a pianist and a cellist as well. And, and there are other um, session musicians on this record as well, I believe as well. So there's a lot happening musically in all of these tracks. And I think Riley is wise to not try and soar above all that too much. Otherwise it would just sound too cluttered. Um, and I don't think it does. Um, Riley's presence isn't wasted though. I think that lyrically he's evocative and strange as ever. Uh, I can definitely understand his very weird writing style being distancing for some people, but I find it kind of beguiling and just weird in a way that I think is endearing and fits the strangeness of the musical arrangements really well. Like it feels like he's trying to match these really unusual chord progressions and instrumental combinations that he uses. He's trying to match that energy with the way he combines words and the actual lyricism on this record. It's like his lyrical construction is mirroring the musical uh, melody construction, which I think is super cool and makes for a record that feels really unified and focused, um, but also unpredictable in a weird kind of contradictory way. Um, so, and, and I'm also just less interested in the real lyrical substance than just the way that as a vocalist, he sits as this anchor within the mix. I don't think he's uh, an, an artist who necessarily writes lyrics to be passed and, and interrogated and broken down. I think, again, it's more about using your words as another texture in the musical palette, basically. Um, and, but he does it, he frequently on this record and on this track in particular, he weaves his vocal melody to complement the jangling and weird guitar melody in the song's chorus. Um, and this song has a really weird chorus. It kind of goes and he's kind of weaving through it. And it's really, it shouldn't work, but I don't know, it just does. I'm sorry, Tyler, what did he do? That, that's, the, that's literally how the chorus is like sounds. It goes and he's kind of, okay, he's kind of finding pockets in this um, uh, guitar I'm progression. Sorry I, just, sorry, I just didn't quite catch it either time. I was, <laughs> wasn't paying attention. Could we? <laughs> Yeah, you, man. Yeah, I... <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes you get what i mean you heard the record um 
I don't know if I did. <laughs> can can you do it again? Can you do it again just so I get the get the impression? At this point, I want to shout out. At this point, I want to shout out the other instrumental contributors to this album. I want to shout them out by name uh, because they're all immensely talented and they're absolutely locked in to these arrangements that Riley has uh, created. Uh, Andrew Scott Young is the bassist. He's a vital presence on this record. I think there's some really creative bass work all over this thing um, that is a testament to his um, vision. He, but also his the way that he works in tandem with the drummer on this record, Ryan Jewell, who uh, any good rhythm section should be really in sync and should know their place as the core of this kind of music, especially when you're drawing from jazz so much. And again, this kind of record would completely fall apart if it didn't have a good ry rhythm section. And it, it's a testament to these guys in particular who really, I think, sell a lot of these arrangements. Um, and the, there's a breakdown in the final uh, stretch of this song that has a swing to it that uh, is really all because of those two guys. Um, also worth noting, as I mentioned, there's two guitarists on this record, both Riley himself and also uh, Bill McKay, who also plays piano at points. And you get on a lot of these tracks, these dueling guitars uh, that are kind of uh, in sync with each other. Not really how it sounds, but uh, the immediate comparison that comes to mind is like American football, for instance. Um, and it's like if American football tried to make a kind of jazzier folk record for whatever reason. Um, but anyway, these dueling guitars oh, often, want it. <laughs> <laughs> they often kind of surface and bounce off each other in a way that again enhances that jazzy feel, both in terms of musical progressions, but also jazzy in terms of the communal sound of the pieces as a, in terms of as a band. And it, it, it works to great effect, I think. Um, I uh, think the record really hits a stride here in the middle with another really great song, Axis Bent, which is a delightfully smooth and even slightly funky uh, track. And it, it blossoms into an almost dancey stop, stomp at certain points. And I think this is emblematic of this album's greatest joys for me, which is its sheer unpredictability, but also how the really smart arranging allows for these kinds of playful shifts in tone from funk to dance to whatever you do have these jarring shifts in tone but there's a, the, the arrangements kind of always they always get they always work for me um because of the sheer commitment to them uh i think axis bent is probably the most accessible track on the album and i think if you were to focus in on one song to try and unlock riley walker's sound and what riley's doing on this record i would say it's this one it has um, this really minor but um, memorable guitar solo part that emerges three minutes in, and it's just leathered in fuzz and distortion to the point that it kind of barely even emerges from the mix. It's kind of like swampy, um, but then it hardly matters because the song just descends into Beatles-esque chaos before completely going silent, and then the basic home groove at this, from the start of the track reasserts itself, and it comes full circle. Uh, it's a wonderful little slice of contained chaos that, again, feels very spontane spontaneous, but also feels very orchestrated at the same time. Um, a, song, an, a song I might suspect to be um, divisive, as well as the track Clad with Bunk, uh, which opens in media's res with a zigzagging distorted riff before it kind of collapses into a slow-paced pool of acoustic guitars and bass. And then you have the song um, building up its mix gradually. And, and Riley delivers some of his most impassioned vocals on the record to complement this shift. Uh, once again, the chord changes here are very jazzy and unusual. The ostensible folk slash rock presentation of the music, I think, doesn't adequately prepare you for these kinds of unconventional progressions. But I, I think it does give the music such an indefinable emotional tone as well, like I mean indefinable, like I can't quite see exactly whether what the emotional tone is here. And I could easily imagine again, finding that infuriating. But also to me, I love how impassioned the performances get here. There are points in the song in which it feels like it's truly soaring. Um, and then there's this fantastic shift about three and a half minutes into the song. Uh, you get a new distorted guitar line entering to anchor the song into a funky stomp much like Axis Bent. And then you get the music swelling in a new way around this stomping rhythm as Riley solos and the whole thing comes to quite a satisfying conclusion. Although I also like the way it ends on an open note just as the final kicker. Um, a song that 
the the song that I a song I originally hated but I've come to love and uh, really appreciate is the track Pond Scum Ocean, <laughs> which I think threw me because it deviates most not noticeably from the record's general palette because it opens with a steady electronic beat as opposed to the organic drums we're used to. And then Andrew Scott Young's bass lays on top of it gorgeously uh, and then stands up to walk all over it. You get, again, that really uh, funky walking bass style. Um, and this song kind of like jams for like three minutes before like Riley even comes in. You get this nice and noodly uh, passage as the guitars come in with a kind of deer hunter-esque watery tone that arpeggiates and layers and, and explores the surface of this rhythm be bedrock, uh, settling into a looping single chord iteration over and over and over as the rhythm is shifting beneath it. Um, I hate to use this word for the fucking 50th time, but it's so fucking jazzy. It just grooves in the coolest way. Um, and eventually, about three minutes in, the main melodic section emerges from the jamming, and I think Riley lays down one of his most compelling and gorgeous vocals on top of it. Uh, he also shows off a sense of humor in his writing here. Um, the cup, one of the couplet that immediately stands out is, if I only gave to charity more often, the city streets would have a spit shine that is glowing. And I find that kind of writing um, to be both self-effacing, but also genuinely funny. It's a kind of like a wry subversion of the self-important and grandiose songwriter cliche. This notion that, um, you know, I can change the world, um, but then the changed world that he imagines is a world that spit shines. So it's kind of like the dirty because of him not actually cleaner. Um, so yeah, that's a really cool little bit of um, image subversion that he goes on there. Um, I, that said, this is a long track. I could definitely see finding it to be, no pun intended, ponderous. It is seven minutes long. It's probably the most purely jammy and low key thing here, but it's also uh, one of the prettiest, I think. So Riley pulls off that mix really well. Um, and then you have the closing track, uh, Shiva with Dustpan, which I think is a really satisfying and gentle closer to the record. It has uh, the most, I think it strips back some of the weirder arrangements of this album to something that's more straightforwardly ornate and gorgeous. The strings on this track in particular are really just sumptuous. Um, and also Riley has a really hooky vocal melody that um, I think is uh, needed at this point in the record to really kind of bring things to a tidy close. Uh, I've had that melody of the chorus of this song in my head for much of this week. Um, it's a, it's a, a wisely straightforward, but nice ending to a record that goes through a lot of different um, shifts and ups and downs. Uh, and honestly, uh, I really, I'm not too concerned if people don't gravitate to this record like I did. It's definitely a kind of a quite idiosyncratic and, and again, very different to the sort of thing we normally review. Um, but I definitely wanted to, especially because we didn't have much else to talk about besides Brockhampton this week, I definitely wanted to have it in here because uh, the more I've paid attention to this record since it's come out, the more I've grown to love it. I am, it, you're all automatically likely to get me on board when you have making a record that's so just boldly original um, from the outset. Um, and I find it relentlessly interesting. I love the way that it never stays static for long. I love the way that it shifts. I love the way it plays with tonality, the way it plays with chord possibilities. And just generally, it's really cool to see artists who apply uh, jazz principles to rock instrumentation. A lot of uh, uh, rock bands who go jazzy, like it will actually kind of bring in the saxophones and the brass and the trumpets and whatever to, and the clarinets and stuff to, you know, make sure that the audience definitely knows we're doing a jazz thing. But this band, Riley's band doesn't do that. They incorporate principles of jazz uh, purely with the stereotypical rock slash folk instrumentation. And I think that's a really smart move. And I think um, it maybe results in something that will have less wide appeal, but it results in something that's also truer to Riley's uh, artistic personality basically um so yeah i really dig this record and i'm even if no one digs it as much as me i am curious to hear about um how you found listening to it and uh, what kind of thoughts you have in general well since everybody's in such a <laughs> fucking rush <laughs> okay um honest to god um I 
I just exist to fucking fulfill Tyler's hypotheticals he throws out whenever he's just like, this might not gravitate toward, this might not, for some, and then it's just like, it is me, I'm these people. I'm, I've, I'm a fucking, I'm so, I'm just so fucking predictable. Um, I'm in this I, picture and I don't like it. I, a picture well, look, I am. I, I know that the worst thing in the world is when someone's talking about something as though it's like obviously obvious why it's obviously great and you just don't get it yeah. and so i wanted to obviously um do justice the things i think are great about this record but with the caveat yeah. that the presentation of this record is you know not going to appeal to everyone and i obviously i acknowledge yeah. that straight away well uh <laughs> i mean i i i i think the album is good i just also think it's it, it's it's quite unwieldy and i could get on board with that just not with this brand of unwieldy and I, I i have tried to at least make some of my points a little bit uh better as to not sound like a complete fucking moron but um i do like um the first track and how triumphant and fun it starts it's got a really subtle bass groove I like the whirring synth uh, kind of guides that lead melody. It's really great. Guitar work is fucking awesome. Uh, this is a very proggy song, but in a very refreshing kind of way. Uh, kind of reminds me of Father John Misty in terms of vocals and lyrical irreverence a lot of the time, just like intonations occasionally. It's, he's a bit more muted than uh, uh, Josh is, but you know, it, it's close. I, I, I dig it occasionally. Um, I do like Rang Dizzy, especially those violins and strings. Those are always really nice when they're incorporated in. Um, uh, but there seems to be a bit too many instrumental ideas happening all at once here. And a lot of them just don't really feel like they coalesce 100% with one another. But I would hardly call the effect bad. Maybe it's more disorienting and maybe that's more your speed. It's not mine. Um, it's just not as tight as I would like. Uh, I do like the line, fuck me, I'm alive, fucking relatable. Um, I like the, the rapid descending on the guitar on a lenticular slap, which I just want to, what, fucking, th this title sucks, a lenticular, sh shut the fuck up, lenticular, <laughs> fuck you, what does that mean, <laughs> shut up. I don't know what that means. I'm gonna look it up. No, I don't either. It just it, it I just hear it and feel annoyed for some reason. It, I'm just like it's funny uh, you say like, this because like Pokemon I spent cards. like <laughs> <laughs> it's it's funny you mentioned this because I was like spending so much time on on Google just like looking up the definitions of words, trying to like piece it together in my head. Like, what the fuck does this even mean? And I think that goes back to what Tyler was saying about like the, the, the lyrics and what have you, which I do have a point about, but um, uh, I, I like it, the, the, the descending guitar at the start. Um, I'm not really a fan of the movement that it kind of progresses into though, um, especially at first. Uh, it just feels like it's on the verge of starting every few seconds and then doesn't it's like i'm being edged not in a cool way not a fan but it's just it's just kind of switching itself up so often that i can't really tell where one idea starts and the other begins um i, I like riley's voice a lot but i i must admit i know that maybe the the songwriting is not the draw here but i guess in this type of music it's something that i pay a little bit more attention to uh, it's really hit and miss with me. This song specifically feels so... It's either too loose or too impenetrable, and I can't figure out which. Um, it, it's aforementioned irreverence, kind of its undoing. His, his writing often feels kind of clunky, which isn't even necessarily bad, but the idea is I don't know. They don't feel like they complement each other when some of the instrumental stuff is a kind of aimless already. And I just end up getting stuck on certain lyrics and missing others because of like the different rhythm in which they're often delivered. I, I also don't really care for some of the drum sounds on this track. Some of them sound really thin and they lack punch in the mix. Uh, it sounds like I have probably more problems with this record and 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 song than than i end up actually having but it's more negative than what i really think because all of my problems kind of just so happen to bottleneck in this one song probably more than the others um uh you know axis bent 
chill, focused uh, point near the end where there's like a squelching horn and distorted guitars. Really like how it builds to that moment before snapping back into place at the end. Kind of cool. Clad with bunk, energetic. I like this track instrumentally. Songwriting, again, obstacle for me because whether intentional or not, some of these lines just kind of a fail to evoke anything. No matter how hard I think about spare tire distilled makes one eye turn gray or new craft inflates us all, can any takers tear down a wall? I, I don't- Cedric what, Bixler is a valid type beat. Yeah, well, see, that's the thing is that when he says exoskeletal junction at the railroad delayed, it's like, yeah, man, live your truth. I don't know what you're talking about, but that sounds wicked. And then this dude's singing, yeah. and he's like f- singing like he's a folk singer about this shit. And I'm just like, yeah, I fucking mean, what? Like Cedric was just like, exoskeleton, exoskeleton <laughs> at the rail <laughs> Delayed. Am I right, yeah. fellas? And it's like, doesn't. Fucking um, dick fart, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite part. <laughs> yeah. Credit, credit that to uh, uh, not tourniquet. Isn't that yep. on there? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, I like how it sort of becomes kind of a southern rock jam at the end of that song. That was pretty cool. Um, Pond Scum Ocean starts out with this weird shuffling instrumental. It sounds like fucking IDM. It's, it's kind of eerie and discordant guitar strumming at the start. And uh, I can't wait until I die. Yeah, me either, bro. Uh, Shiva with Dustpan, though. Uh, love the instrumental on this last song here. There's a strong melody, great instrumental density without getting too scattered or busy. Even the songwriting hits most of the marks, uh, and it strikes the right balance with me. I think it's a, it's a nice ending to the record. It, it's, it's, it's quite lovely. Uh, this is just a classic case of album trying lots of many different things upon re-listen I uncover exactly what does and does not work for me in startling clarity. And unfortunately it was a little, it was a little bit like a lot of misses, more hits though, but it, again, not quite my tempo. I think you just kind of put it good and that you were just like, you know, some people aren't gonna be on this album's speed. And I am clearly not in my dumb brain. Give me the pop music, I guess. Fair enough. I appreciate you um, digging into the tracks. Um, I know it's a kind of, I know when you can't vibe with something like this, the whole thing can kind of just blend together. But um, I do think that there's like, I mean, to me, it's like distinct every- enough to not blend together. It wasn't quite a chore to re listen to again. I'll say that much. Mm. Cool. Well, Glad to hear it. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think uh, striking down your big premiere was a, a pretty good mission statement for the record. This kind of album focusing on these like exciting instrumental passages with weird Im- with like strange discordant imagery. Uh, I mean, a lot of what I get of, get from it is kind of this sense of of positivity from overcoming some kind of addiction, presumably drug, alcohol related, which as I read a bit into this, that seems to be what Riley Walker was trying to channel. And I I definitely picked up on some of that. I mean, and it's all very roundabout. Uh, The most like direct lyricism coming on Rang Dizzy, which has already been talked to death, that line, Uh, but generally, it's a record where I feel myself uh, kind of like on principle, I think it's not a bad record, not a bad idea of something to do, but in practice, I'm turned off by a lot of it. Uh, Mainly the production, I think lands a bit on the boring thin side of things. It doesn't quite have this energy edge or there's a certain grit lacking in the production that I think really kills a lot of the momentum he could have had and could have built up with the sound in particular. Uh, And secondly, the prog elements of this record, I appreciate them sometimes, but other times I think they can lean a little too into the jammy side of prog where it just feels like noodling around and not 
particularly progressing in a way I find terribly exciting. That being said, I'm sure he's a wonderful live act for this reason of being able to see this kind of these structures conveyed in a live setting where the runtime isn't something you can just look down at your phone at and see how much time is left in a track where you can really get that jamminess and that progression out of the out of just physically being there but as as a record it doesn't really do a whole lot for me i myself prefer the jelly side of prog so <laughs> I, I enjoyed this record well enough um i think really the biggest hindrance for me is what august said about the production where it just kind of lacks impact and grit and as a result the whole thing kind of ends up going in one ear and out the other to some degree uh but i wouldn't say there's anything outright bad here um or really even anything outright mid it's just very consistently barely getting the heart rate up so to speak um it's like a like a nice walk through a park you're not jogging you're not banging you're just you know air smells nice having a walk clear your head the fuck am i talking about you just really um, want to go outside man it's okay i understand <laughs> i mowed grass today i don't want to go outside ever again <laughs> I kind of oh, no. get the vibe you're going for though, because when I listen to something like Rang Dizzy, for instance, it does have a kind of like, I don't know, like a springtime vibe. Like it, had, it yeah. does have, it, have a kind of um, feel to it that's very sort of. Something definitely very, feels like April. Yeah. Well, w- one yeah. thing I want to shout out um, that I forgot to mention that I really love is uh, I've talked to. I don't know. I don't. I guess maybe the issue is like so much of what I love about this this record is to do with like musicality and um, a lot of the technical aspects of like the, com- the composing and the arrangement and it's difficult to like talk about those things without being like ooh, 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 I'm a smart person who likes musical theory and shit and I deliberately tried to avoid touching on that but like there are like so so much of what is so interesting about this record is I guess and I don't like saying you know this record is interesting in an intellectual way because it, it, it cheapens the whatever record you're talking about and it automatically turns people off from checking it out I think but I do think there is a lot of it that is just really musically inter- interesting or a lot of what gets it to me is like a lot of the way that certain musical sounds and how weirdly how weirdly they're put together uh, unconventionally they're put together kind of just hits this nerve in my brain that a lot of unconventional weird music and, and jazz is a big example um, does and like for instance one aspect one specific detail that I forgot to bring up is I love the uh, unconventional time signature on um, striking down your big premiere when it's got that guitar line that goes there's just an extra beat sometimes there'll be an extra bar or other times there'll be like a bar uh not the opposite of an extra bar (laughs) they'll take one away and they'll just like shift up hot bars we got bars he'll shift up the time signature (laughs) yeah shift up the time signature and for me that's the thing that kind of keeps it from staying aim keeps it from being aimless and and makes it instead like always kind of shifting and forward moving and but yeah that's i don't know maybe just not something that necessarily everyone goes to music for um so i don't know it's not it's not that so much as i just find so much of it lacks an impact and thus deadens the effect of yeah all of that to some degree that's that's that's, that's pretty much yeah how i feel Cubits. Sersha, you were going to add anything? I don't know how much I can add, I guess, but um, there is a lot of technical competency and ambition on show on this record. Like, I listen to this and I'm like, Riley, my guy, you, you sure know what you're doing. You sure know how to handle an instrument. Do I... Uh, 
and and I can like sit and appreciate that and enjoy listening to your record on that level. That's great. Do, do I feel a single goddamn thing listening to that? Maybe not. This to me, and I had this thought while listening to it. This to me is kind of like an anti Sersha album. <laughs> yeah, a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good. I, it's I don't think I, I think it's a good record. I I will not say it's bad, but it's like I I feel n- nothing listening to it, and that's a problem for me because that is what I go to music for, and I can well <laughs> enjoy appreciating the craft. Like that's my main appeal because it's a really well put together record with a lot of ambition that's realized to the fullness that they set out to realize it to. I think if there's a takeaway from this discussion, it's that um, we can all kind of, if we don't, if some of us don't necessarily enjoy a record, that doesn't mean that we don't appreciate a lot of the technical technical aspects of it. I don't just mean like, are we, of course we appreciate the effort that goes into making an album. I mean, you can appreciate a lot of what's inventive and yeah, creative absolutely. and original yeah. about a record in terms of how it's made and still not absolutely. necessarily have the, uh, the emotional connection that, I mean, I wouldn't even say I have an emotional connection to this record. I just kind of jam to it. Like it just, mm. it just hits certain wires in my brain. And maybe that's mm. like, uh, maybe that's like an Orteca thing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to I hate to draw on that again and again and again, but I, I can see why you do though. I can but... definitely see where you're coming from with that. Fucking Riley Walker is uh folk prog for Autecker fans. <laughs> <laughs> God, yeah. Am, am I having a stroke? I, think I, might <laughs> I feel like I just had one. Okay. Now I've got fucking Mason oh, Verger God. hair. What the fuck oh, happened to yeah. me? Speaking no, of Bert strokes, control. should we go into favorite tracks and ratings if no one has anything else left to say? I, I think we should. Speaking of strokes, is this it? Let's move on. Um. <laughs> oh, yes, so my favorite tracks are <laughs> Atlanticular Slap. Uh, I would say oh. Shiva with Dustpan <laughs> and Rang Dizzy. Uh, my least favorite track, I don't really have one. It's all kind of uniformly great to me. I am going to give this record a 9 out of 10. Nice. Uh, my favorite tracks here are Striking Down Your Big Premier, Brang Dizzy, and Axis Bent. I'm going to give the record a 6 out of 10. And my three favorites are uh, Rang Dizzy, Shiva with Dustpan, and Axis Bent. Uh, least favorite, I'll actually, uh, I'll probably say the first track, Striking Down Your Big Premiere. Um, six and a half. Mm-hmm. Favorite tracks, uh, Shiva with Dustpan, uh, Rang Dizzy, and... Shiva here. Sorry. <laughs> Axis <laughs> Bent. Least favorite is Ponska Motion, I would give this a five out of ten. Jake. Jake's in night vision now. Yep, that's me. Um, my favorite song on the record is Shiva with Dustpan, and I guess Strike It Down to Big Premiere and uh, Axis Bent are pretty good too. Um, my least favorite track is uh, Lenticu. Fuck, fuck you, Riley. Don't call your shit stupid, dumb bullshit. Uh, I give it a 5.5. Alrighty ho, and that results in an average of. I'll give you a six. lenticular slap, motherfucker. Well, first you yeah, have to figure out what it is. Yeah, it could be like a blowjob. Okay, but like, this point. okay, but like, okay, but like, I get complaining about uh, my comparison to Cedric with the lyricism because you're right; it's not delivered in a comparable style that Cedric sells his lyricism with. But in terms of song titles. You can't get mad at a lenticular <laughs> slap and then be like, Wax Simulacra, that's a, a great title. Wax for- Simulacra sounds baller. A lenticular it's- slap sounds like someone hitting me with a flaccid <laughs> penis. Also, like, I can picture She's got what you a, there, a Tyler. wax I don't know. simulacra <laughs> is. I can't picture a lenticular a, a, a slap. A lenticular slap sounds like um, the modern name for, like... Lenticular a slap. I, 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 it, sounds, I, it sounds like, like, a modern name for a Stone Age treatment for back pain. I, I think it sounds like a kinky sex thing. 
like which has already been suggested and See, it I says lenticular and i think lent so i immediately associate it with catholicism which is already bad oh dear god That's... i've had lenticular slap or two in the bedroom in my time um oh i oh where i'm just trying to look for where i asked <laughs> <laughs> I can't find it well, uh, okay so one of, one of the definitions of uh what of lenticular is relating to the lens of the eye or iris i think if i slap on an eye. open wet eyeball well maybe maybe <laughs> then it's like um someone who shoots you a, who, who shoots you a glance and it feels like a that slap was, that was my thought process as well but it also mm. could be a slap on an open eyeball lord knows that would hurt like a son of a bitch <laughs> yeah fair enough um, did we get? Yeah, we got all the ratings, so we have yeah average... six point four on average, which I'll take. Uh, it. Yeah, um, which is <laughs> all thoughts fly, Kiki, uh, uprooted, kick Eeky. one, kick one. Oh, I I yeah. thought I had a stroke, and I was just like, yeah. okay, we covered that on the Rubber Gum podcast, yeah, no, and that I did not have that low of an average thing. rating, Sarsha. I would. I would. It's, so... it's okay. It's a, it's a stupid <laughs> album title, anyway. Um, what's What's funny is that so this album doesn't even. Ha- this album still has a lower standard deviation than Roadrunner. <laughs> <laughs> How is that possible? No, that's just weird. because four of us gave it virtually the same rating. Math uh, also gave are the other hard. One virtually the same rating. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway. Um, well, obviously not. <laughs> Anyway, oh, so yeah. those are the two albums we discussed today. If you've heard either of these records, let us know in the comments section below what you think of these albums. Uh, I, if Riley, if you're watching this, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> just kidding. No, Riley's not going to watch this. You can give me a lenticular <laughs> slap if you ever see me in real life. <laughs> um, but anyway, yes, let us know what you think of these albums, um, what you think of our takes, hot takes, opinions. Um, and yeah, next week... Oh, wait. Mm. Make sure you go and check out our first, the first in our 1991 retrospective series on Massive Attack's Blue Lines. That'll be up very soon. So make sure you go and check that shit out. And then next week, we are going to be reviewing uh, two records that have been getting a lot of attention online um, lately. And I suspect may or may not be reasonably divisive and make for reasonably interesting conversations. That being the new record from post-hardcore noise rock band, The Armed. Uh, and we'll also be talking about the new record from, I don't even know how to describe them genre-wise, but they're called Spirit of the Beehive, and they have an interesting album out. So we'll be reviewing both of those next week, so stay tuned for that. And August, do you want to take us away? Of course. Rock Over London. Rock on Chicago. Wrigley's Double Mint Gum. Double your pleasure. Double your fun. What?